Hello and welcome to the new episode of the Game Informer Show. I'm your host, Ben Hansen, joined by Andrew Reiner. Hello, Ben Hansen. We got Kyle Hilliard here. Hi. And we have JV Gwaltney. Hey, everyone. What's up? Old messy hair himself. Oh, good. We got a big show talking about Resident Evil 7. Huge game. The world's on fire talking about it. Very exciting. Also going to talk about Ghost Recon Wildlands, which, JV, where did you go to play this thing? San Francisco. And how much did you play? Uh, actually, about four hours. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah we got plenty to talk about. You have some hot takes? Yeah, I have some some piping hot takes oh right God, out of the oven. Form. Uh, gonna touch, talk a little bit about the Overwatch uh, big event. Reiner, did you play a little bit of that oh, too? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, capture Loot the rooster. Loot boxes galore. The whole thing, we'll break that all down. Then we got some great community emails, and then the back half of the show, I'm excited about this. And it's a strange coincidence that these two shows are back to back, but we have people from Vicarious Visions on. It's Kara Massey and the game director, Dan Tangway, who are working on the Crash Bandicoot remaster. Ooh. The insane trilogy. And so it's bizarre that we have two Vicarious Visions interviews really in a row on the podcast. Uh, but it's a good chat basically about how the hell does a separate development team, separate from Naughty Dog, start from square one creatively and technically to remake those old PlayStation 1 games, which I'd imagine is quite a challenge. So we talk about the differences in the remaster compared to the originals. Uh, it gets pretty technical. It's, it's a fun chat. So if you're a Crash fan, I think you'll enjoy it. But for now... We're going to talk about Resident Evil 7. Yeah, I feel like someone's been staring at me for a while here. <laughs> Have you just been playing too much RE7? It's just yeah, kind of maybe I'm getting a, a creepy vibe to my left <laughs> over here. We have a very special guest. Huh? We have one Steve Gaynor to welcome to the family here at Game Informer. So, welcome Steve from Fulbright. Hey everybody. Uh, thanks for having me on to to chat about uh, freaky houses and walking around them. <laughs> <laughs> it's really your specialty. So Steve, uh -huh. if you don't remember him from being on the podcast uh, months ago, I guess, writer designer for Bioshock 2's Minerva's Den DLC, Gone Home, working on Tacoma, most importantly, the Tone Control podcast, which has been dormant for way too long, Steve. Well, I'm 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 planning on bringing it back, but uh, too much video game development going on for me right now. That's but right. After Tacoma's out, I want to do more of those those good good dev interviews. Awesome, but we wanted to have yeah. you on the show because you've been tweeting a lot about RE7. You've been streaming some of your playthrough. You seem really enthusiastic about it. I saw the official Resident Evil account was tweeting out yeah. snippets of your stream as well. <laughs> and I don't know if you yeah. noticed, but Resident Evil Seven uh, feels a little gone homey. I yeah, I mean. And it's a it's very much an Ouroboros of um, you know the original Resident Evil Mansion was certainly a point of reference for me when working on Gone Home, um, and so then playing Resident Evil Seven and being like, some of this feels a little like Gone Home. <laughs> it's a, it's a cool, um, I mean, you guys you guys of, considered yeah. guns for Gone Home, right? Just carrying everyone <laughs> around. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just. We considered guns, but no bullets. So you're just sort of like, <laughs> click, I got this, click. I guess. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Plenty of yeah, gross food. You know. It's got everything. So, Reiner, you actually reviewed Resident Evil 7. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious, what did you think of this thing? I liked it. And I'm, I want to go back to Square One when it, they first debuted Resident Evil 7. And it yeah. really looked like it was going to be almost like a new IP with the Resident Evil name on it. It was more a ghost story about supernatural stuff. which new really IP didn't... or a new PT, Reiner? Oh, no. yeah. Very nice. But it, uh, yeah, I was I was a little worried about it at that point, and in, in that I always liked the series' campy science fiction and like you know these shadow organizations working on top secret projects. I think people know Umbrella better than any character in the game. You know the whole organization <laughs> behind it. Sure. Uh, Characters. So I was concerned about that, but after playing Resident Evil Seven now, I could say it fits really nicely in with all the other entries because they do go back uh, at a certain point and connect the dots. In a really interesting way. Interesting but subtle way seemed to be your impression. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to read documents. You know, it's it's Res Evil at heart. Yeah. I, I think that's the thing. And you really do get that connection, too, when you're playing through the mansion. Uh, again, it starts out kind of like a ghost story, but that's kind of a smoke screen. And all, once you get to know the Baker family a little, it opens yeah. up more and becomes a game of opening locked doors, you know, hunting for items, kind of those trademark uh, qualities of Res Evil where you are moving room to room to room. And I think they do a really awesome job of keeping that fresh and introducing unexpected elements, whether that's a character jumping out at you or giving you a, a different adversary, uh, trying to figure out how to handle that, that foe in the environment. So the months and months of people being like, this isn't RE7, this isn't a real RE game, look at that, it's first person. It's just 
you think all those arguments are just null and void now? Yeah, I do. Out? I think by the time you finish the game, you'll be like, that was a cool Resident Evil game. Interesting. I mean, so it, so you finished the game real quick just to lay the land. I played the first couple hours. Steve's played the first couple hours. JV, you finished it. Kyle, you're basically at the end. He's almost, right there. Yeah, 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 almost at the end. Okay, the credits have started rolling and then you pause it and came down to <laughs> yeah. That's it's right. It's his yeah. favorite part of the game, the credits. Is yeah. that right? Uh, Steve, I'm curious, just in a broad sense, what's most interesting to you about Resident Evil 7? Well, I, I mean... From uh, from a player's perspective, I'm really excited that they that they took a big departure from kind of the last ten plus years of Resident Evil games. I mean, I think that that was that's what really defines the the great entries in the Resident Evil series. Is Resident Evil One obviously a new thing, but it was really in a lot of ways unlike I think anything that that people had played before, aside from maybe Alone in the Dark on PC. But it was like a very fresh new experience. And then Resident Evil Four completely rethought what Resident Evil means. And I think that since that point, a lot of people have been like, oh, I want Resident Evil to get back to horror and get back to really feeling oppressively, you know, like you're you're in this uh, kind of like stressful, you know, traditional survival horror scenario. Um, and Resident Evil 7, I think, has done that in a way that's very modern and very surprising to the point of them being like, we're going to make a full-on first-person exploration, you know, action game, horror game, where it is just like you in this house and maybe one, you know, really scary enemy that you're that you're trying to figure out how to navigate around, and it really brings back that that feeling, the aesthetic feeling of the original Resident Evil, while not being a throwback in any other way. It's it's totally new method of approaching those things, um, and the technical. Uh, uh, the technical achievement that they've that they've had to pull that off from a development standpoint is really impressive to me because as far as I'm aware, Capcom has never made a full first person game before. And the have the, I mean well, like, like, like this, right? Well Resident there's Evil like, like, like gun games, ex- right? or like Survivor, is that yeah, the PS2 yeah, the PS2 Resident Evil? Era, yeah. yeah, but certainly yeah. not a fully narrative based first person game, right. I don't think. Yeah. And and so like seeing I mean Capcom's a huge you know, uh, a company, they have a ton of resources, but seeing them really make what I think is a, feels like a very accomplished first person game in controls and presentation and, and everything um, that you're kind of doing and interacting with on screen. I'm like, wow, they, they haven't done this before and they really nailed it. And there's a lot of really impressive set pieces and stuff. So I've only played a few hours, but kind of on all levels, I was really surprised um, by what they pulled off. You seemed in particular just fascinated by the volumetric lighting. This is this <laughs> yeah. is why we have developers it's on the show. Shadow What's, thirst over yeah. there. Yeah, what got you so hot and heated about the, volume, <laughs> the lighting in this game? Well, so like they, they have a lot of um, cool... Uh, uh, subtle effects. One of the other things that I was excited about is, um, you know how in some in some levels in games where there's water, you'll see like the the you know wiggly lights going up on the wall, the caustics. Um, yeah. There was a moment where I was backtracking, and I realized that when you shine your flashlight on the surface of the water, it like reflects those wiggly lights like up onto the walls from where you're shining your flashlight, and like with the volumetric lighting. You know, it's cool and everything, but then when you walk in front of a projector and it's like projecting volumetric light from your hand and like, um, you know, you can really visibly see that it's in real time kind of having that effect and it's not just baked in. Um, Those kinds of subtle details um, that are also technically impressive, like when you see those in a game, you're like, oh, okay, (laughs) oh, wow, you know, they did the work. This is all on screen. Um, and, And they're the kind of details that aren't, the heart of like what you think about generally when you're playing the game, but when you do notice them, um, just seeing those those extra little pieces of um, kind of how the world and how the lighting works be on screen um, is just is just cool to see, you know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so they've been pitching for a while the Resident Evil Return to Horror. I feel like the Revelation series in particular has been a big message for Capcom is now we're back to horror. But with RE7, it really feels like they're capturing that. Like, why why the slow burn now, and why do you think it works? Reiner, you reviewed the game. Well, that's a tough question. I, I don't want to spoil too much of, of what happens, but uh, you know, when you look back at the original games, at the type of horror they had, it was a lot of jump scares, dogs jumping through windows. You know, that was like the first time I think I really jumped during a game. And from that point on, it was all bets are off. Every hallway you go down, you, you kind of round the corner slowly, or when you hear something, you know, you, you pause. All that's in this, and I think that's kind of the brilliance of this game's design is 
they're not afraid to have nothing happening in this game. I love that. Mm -hmm. Where yeah. there will be no sound, there will be no action. It's just you in a kitchen or in a bedroom and you're scared to death because there's nothing happening. And then you might hear a creak. Yep. You might see a shadow dance or something like that. And then, you know, it, it becomes something so much more just from that one moment of silence. It's, I love that. It's a game that's great at playing with your imagination because, you know, you'll always hear like footsteps above you. Yeah. And you're like, okay, is that, you know, the crazy hillbilly going to come and hit me with his <laughs> hammer? Or, you know, is that just a creak? Because this is an old house. Like, I think that's honestly my favorite thing about this game is the sound design and also... I can't remember if it's Steve Reiner was talking about how it's not a throwback. It's it's going back, but it's also a reinvention. And I think the biggest part about that is the setting. Like, I just love that it's in Louisiana and that it's like <laughs> this old dilapidated estate instead of being the fancy mansion from the right. first one because it sells that atmosphere that yeah. you're in a creepy house that might be haunted or whatever. Nothing scary about Colorado, but the South. <laughs> the South is, <laughs> no, like swamps and gators and water moccasins and like there's enough scary <laughs> in the South besides crazy like hillbillies coming to get you does it really add a lot is it just so For, they can have kind of did. like a yellowish tint to everything because of course that's what the south looks like yeah. you just feel hot when you're in there right. really warm in and here. heat's terrifying it's, it's very simple sweltering that's, heat is terrifying that's why jv and i got out of there we yeah were just so scared we were actually sweating during the stream <laughs> yeah. is it like the full that, oh go ahead steve uh, I, I was gonna say i think that's i think part of what's interesting about um what they've done with the with kind of the new direction of the game, both formally and everything, but it feels like there's a few really clear um, uh, reference points that they've pulled in that are interesting to be part of how they're approaching Resident Evil now, because it feels like feels very Silent Hill, feels very Silent Hill Two and PT, right? So it kind of feels like Silent Hill Two and Silent Hills at different points, and other like other media touchstones, like it feels like they definitely watched a lot of True Detective. Right? Oh, <laughs> like, uh, opening cutscene. Oh, yeah. 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 And and it's so it's just interesting playing a Japanese game that's a full first person game that's part of this long, um, you know, whatever, 20 plus year um, series of horror titles and see how they're bringing Western influences and influences from other horror games into the tone and the mood of the game and kind of bringing it all together. It's 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 unexpected and it's cool to see that they're like, if we want to bring this back, we're, we're going to refer to this and this, and these are kind of our touchstones and how do we make that into Resident Evil? I mean, you joke about the snake eating its own tail, but do you think that Gone Home was an influence on this game? Um, I, well, so, okay. So what I'll say is I think definitely Amnesia, the Dark Descent, was an influence on the game. Like, there are moments I've, I've only, so I've played, like, the first three hours, and there are moments that are very Amnesia-y, where you're just like, you have no weapon, there's somebody creeping around, and, and you're like, I'll hide in this corner and hope they go away. And, like, you know, it's it's a very, very Amnesia-feeling um, uh, set of mechanics in some parts of the game. And so I think that um, the team was definitely influenced by Western indie horror games, Um and possibly Western indie first-person exploration games. Um, I, I do, you know, there, there's an early moment where they introduce the whole, like, you can click on an object, and then you examine it, and you rotate it. And I was like, I feel, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, my and, thing, my, you know, my direct line to Gone Home was just going through uh, everyone's drawers. <laughs> like, that, I, I, that's, yeah. I instantly thought of Gone Home as like, oh, man, I'm just rifling through this family's crap. Yeah, where's the narration? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that grandma character you can really tech to, to connect to if you like you know oh, her yeah. personally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like, I think that, I think that's, that's one of those interesting elements where you definitely feel like people on that team were very aware of, like, all the different aspects of kind of what could apply to, to what they're trying to do with, with RE7. Reiner, does it deviate from that? Does it get more into gunplay? Oh, yeah. You just yeah. have a shotgun oh, yeah. later on, but you're yeah. always in this house, right? The second you get your gun, it changes the script. Reiner gets his gun. <laughs> it really does change script at that point, but they do not abandon the stuff that came before entirely. They will go back and toy with Again, this kind of weird ghost story, possession kind of story that's going on. But it does become more about lining up headshots. Is I don't want to I really don't want to spoil anything for people because discovery sure. is such a big part of this game. <laughs> yeah. 
but there are things in this house besides the bakers. I'll say that much. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. to to piggyback off that. I think one of the most impressive things about Resident Evil Seven is that it strikes a balance between sort of first person shootery stuff and the hide and go seek elements of amnesia and alien isolation. Because I I really like alien isolation, but I think it's like also a 10 to 12 hour game where you're playing hide and seek and that can get super frustrating just yeah. dying over and over again and resident evil 7 is really good about making you more active at times with combat and whatnot it's good about striking that balance and that's something that indie horror games i've noticed have trouble with i feel like yeah 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 i, I agree that i feel like again not to spoil too much but even the part I've played, there's a you start to get into sequences that feel very much like being hunted by the alien in um, Alien Isolation. I think that, that isn't a point of reference I had thought of, but it's a really good point. Um, but I think that mechanically it works better in Resident Evil 7 because you can avoid it, but if there's a confrontation, you can actually um, you know have some some kind of uh, interaction with this thing that's tracking you aside from just let it run up and kill you and, and load your game. Right. Like, I, I haven't died very much in Resident Evil 7, but I have felt like I got close. You know, it's sort of like you have to evade, you have to try to lose it. You can stop it for a while to, to get yourself some room. And there's sort of that recoverability of, of those feelings of the sequences, but you're not just like, well, I'm screwed now. I'll try again. You actually have the tools to survive. You know, survival horror. Um, you have the tools to to survive when one of those when when you're in one of those tracking sequences. But you still are like, if I if I don't play my cards right, I'm not going to live through this. And I think that tension is really strong. Yeah, because in isolation, it eventually gets to the point where if you see the alien across the room and it sees you, then you just know you're dead. You're and dead. it's not yep. even scared. It's Okay, let's do this sequence yeah. again. <laughs> yeah, I never felt that way once in Resident Evil. Like it was always, even when I had like low supplies, and this is a game that's super focused on inventory management, probably the most since like three, I think. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah, big yeah. Time. Like four or five and six inventory management isn't like a well, big thing. Four is a, it's a thing you have to consider, but it's not like a huge thing. Okay. Like there, there will always be enough ammo. I feel like, uh, and in this one, I still feel like. As long as you're careful with your shots and whatnot, there's still enough to get by. But I was always had my back against the wall, especially in like encounters when you had like a bunch of things you had to take on. I'm still trying to figure out how dynamic this game is. Like the family members, they do a lot of teases, certainly, of like, oh, look at the end of this hallway, the character's walking by. But is it full alien isolation where in theory no. these characters well, Oh, you, Reiner says yes, Jamie says well, no. I, you, I, so, I some sequences it is. Yeah, I some said. sequences you are hiding behind something as they walk by, mm -hmm. praying that they do not see you. So that is kind of that alien isolation. And they have their thing. own patrol path, like just yeah. minding their yeah. own business? Yeah. But they, they're their yeah. AI. They're going through the house. They're turning, I, looking. But it's not the full game. I played right. through the opening right. four hours twice at this point because I played it at home and then we did the live stream. And I had there were like a couple of sequences that occurred in my playthrough at home that were very memorable that did not happen on our live stream, which oh, I was that's really great. surprised yeah. about. So, yeah. uh, so they do kind yeah. of go on their own. Yeah, when I was streaming it, um, I had a, there was a really good, and this is a little bit of a spoiler, mechanical spoiler, so, I, you know, apologies, but I was being tracked by a character, and and I thought I had a really good evasion route, and it was like, okay, I'll run through here, and I'll ditch him here, and then circle back around, and he won't be able to catch me, and then he just literally busted through <laughs> the wall in front yeah, of me, yeah. and I was like, what, can I swear? Yeah, go for it, man, go for it. <laughs> I was like, this <laughs> uh, but it's like yeah they i but i i have to assume that if i didn't play that way and didn't get the ai there and then end up in this other place at the right time that wall would have never broken down yeah i think those kind of things are totally up to how you play that yeah. that exact sequence had me laughing out loud because it reminded me of res evil 3 with the nemesis yeah which is this beautifully created creature right this <laughs> 10 foot thing with the and in this theme game song, yeah this wall comes down and it looks beautiful when it comes down and then it reveals a half naked hillbilly with like <laughs> glasses who's like throwing f-bombs at uh -huh. me and i was just laughing i was like Get i'm not really scared of this guy right now i was it's, terrified that was of silly. that guy it's <laughs> those stars he'll just i'll do i guess <laughs> so you so steve and jb you guys just played through re4 again and i'm trying to figure out is this game just for the hardcore resident evil fans who love re1 specifically absolutely not you no? can you can have never played a Resident. This is another thing I like about this game. You can have never played a Resident Evil game. Like if you like Amnesia or Alien Isolation or that kind of game, or you just want to play a horror game and have never touched Resident Evil, you can just jump right in. What about connections to four specifically? Because I love four. 
not so much for the horror aspect, but more actually the adventure. Well, I the think problem with that is we're getting into spoiler territory. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's really hard to talk about. But what in comes terms of, next, in yeah. terms of gameplay, if you're saying I love the gameplay of four, but you know, and I want that sort of thing from seven, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Like yeah. that's not a thing. No. Yeah. Without without getting into spoilers, it's like four is this kind of sprawling extended adventure. Right. Yeah. But seven in particular, in a good way, which is very complimentary, gives you a chance to really sit into this house and really get to know it really well, which I, I appreciate games that do that where you stay in one environment and you get to know it really well and you discover shortcuts and all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. So it is separate from four in that regard. It's, it's better, I think, to think of Resident Evil 7 instead of thinking of, of it like RE4, maybe like something like the evil dead like this is survive the night like this is what the story of that game is okay so naturally is it gonna get to evil dead three are we gonna <laughs> like it feels like a full reset right it, it doesn't mean, in the in this game but it might like in you know future entries but it doesn't go evil dead three in this game uh, right, right right but do you want it like first of all i'm still confused about why they call it seven i guess they you, be you weird just have to finish the there game. There are six other yeah. Resident Evils. It will totally make sense <laughs> when you're done. And also, they've already had two Resident Evil 1s at least, <laughs> so it gets very complicated and whatnot. But where do you want the series to go from here? Like, is this everything we want from Resident Evil? We just want them to hit this note again and again in different I, settings? I want them to keep... I want them to just keep trying... Because this is uh, this is what I like about Resident Evil. The best thing about it is, is when those games just try wacky shit and throw everything against the wall. Like one was obviously like a big innovator with like, okay, here's survival horror. And then four was like, let's change this up. This is gonna be like an action packed adventure where sure. monsters show up occasionally. And then seven is just survive the night horror film, picking people off sort of stuff. And it's great. Like those three games are really great and all the other ones like I'm fine with, but I really like it when they try something new. Even like a, when it doesn't work out, like a full rhythm game next, is that? The yeah, game? yeah, I will play. A, I will play a rhythm Resident Evil game. I don't care. Okay. Like, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> the safe well, music. I mean, you just it, tap it feels, every like three minutes. It, it feels to me like um, again. I've only played the first few hours. I've certainly played games that by the time I'm done with them, they don't really uh, hold together. But I have high hopes for for this full game. But it like, at least for me right now, I get the impression that there's a pretty rich base for extension here with Resident Evil 7 like you know the Resident Evil series has never done a great job of being like oh Resident Evil 4 was great we should extend that into 5 and then 6 and you're like okay but um it at least feels like my initial impressions I want to play through the rest of Resident Evil 7 and then I, I feel like I wouldn't be mad if they were like we're gonna do another first person Resident Evil 7 type entry in a different setting with you know etc for for the next title and kept exploring this idea with Resident Evil further. Um, but I don't know how you guys would like finish the game and spend more time with the field. Yeah, I think the first person, kind of the whole mechanic setup of it from first person and what they do in that, I think that is a solid foundation for a whole new series of Resident Evil games. Uh, and yes, they they leave it nice and open for the future. I'll, I'll say yeah. that much, where there's, there's a lot of room for it to grow. I'm still trying to figure out your thoughts on this game, Reiner, because... I feel like you finished the game and you did a lot of walking around the office going like, God, I just don't know. This is such a tough review. It's somewhere in this range, but it's a big range. Yeah. And it sounds like from the conversation, this is everything Resident Evil fans wanted. And so I'm curious, what is that difference in it's your mind? What was what was clawing at you? Well, it's like, it's a whole, it, it walks a fine line between being a new experience and fan service for, for people that have been there since day one, right? Like uh -huh. by the end of the game, you're like, Yes, 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 yes. You did it. You you did exactly what you needed to do to keep everybody happy, right? Like okay. everybody wanted a, a new fresh take on Res Evil. They did that. People still wanted Res Evil. They did that as well. I think that's really difficult to do and and that's crazy that they pulled that off in such such a dynamic way in this game. Uh but the thing, yeah, that I kind of hemmed and hawed with was my connection to that game. Like I thought Ethan as a character <laughs> came up a little short at times. Like I thought he didn't emote all the time when he should have. Like there'll be times right. in the game where he'll see like a wall color uh, covered in millipedes and he's freaking the f out. Uh -huh. Like he's <laughs> like, oh my God. But then really <laughs> tragic things happen to him, right? Like really dramatic things. And even in the life, beginning, yeah. He doesn't say a word. And, and I don't know if Capcom wanted you as the player to be reacting in that moment. 
But then why have him doing other things? You know what I mean? Like it just makes it seem like he just hates bugs, but loves taking axes to people's <laughs> necks. <It's>, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was interesting because Kyle and I were talking about this during the stream yesterday. I also am not a big uh, Ethan fan. I think he's just sort of white bread and annoying and dull. But we were <laughs> there are points where like he'll finish off like an enemy or something, and he'll he'll say like an '80s catchphrase sort of thing. What? Yeah, there's like, not a ton, but there's a couple. And it's quips. just hilarious because it's like, well, I'm a badass now. Like and that's like. One of the few lines he ever has is when he's like insulting corpses or something. <laughs> also, I like the idea of him saying some badass '80s line and then just rummaging through drawers for the next 45 minutes, rotating keys in front of his eyes. Yeah, yeah. it's at odds with with the game being otherwise very serious and like quiet and like yeah. this is a serious Resident Evil guys. But then he's like, "Hey, you better stay dead this time." Yeah, he goes, "Old dude, that's actually a thing he says. Like, that's not even yeah. like stay dead this time." And also with the disparate tone, like I said, they're going for like a more gritty approach, but at least it's very silly early on when he's extremely hurt and then just pours some magic juice on it. It's like, might as well just throw a phoenix down on someone. <laughs> that, that has a little bit of story con. Oh, like really? a little bit of story conceit later. Oh, I don't interesting. know. I mean, okay. not, it's later on it does. Yeah. Later, it's, not later, just, yeah. it's not just magic for the sake of game mechanics. Okay. Know? Yeah. All right. I mean, you saw the staples, man. <laughs> that's true. I mean, that's right. Can we talk about that scene? Because I feel like that's been in the trailers that they've shown uh, off. I think you leave it. Yeah, yeah we, can, oh, we can leave okay. it. That's, that's, a, that's such a, a good dramatic moment, moment we can yeah. dissect, though. Yeah, it's yeah. a dramatic moment. Uh, so it's things like that, like with the, the character not really kind of standing up when there's a lot of room for it and they could have done some great things there, but they wanted to have like both worlds, it seemed like, and it, it just didn't work. Yeah, right? and it's and it's very strange because like everyone else in the game is kind of cliche. Even the bakers themselves, like, oh, murderous hillbillies, but they still have more personality than Ethan, and that's not great. Yeah, yeah. But I think I, mean, I think it's I think ha having worked on games that have like first person characters that talk in them and first person characters that don't talk in them, I think that it's really hard to strike that balance because it's exactly like you said, where like you know, if if I'm playing through and I'm in a sequence, I'm like, oh my god! And then, as I'm thinking that, the character's like, oh my god! Like <laughs> it, 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 it makes it it deflates it so much yeah, for yeah. me because you're like, I know, like you know, <laughs> you, know you, you don't have to be impressed with how f***ed up your own game is, you know, like I it, and but like you guys are saying, if the character's there and if the character can talk, shouldn't they be saying like, oh my god, you know, like why are they silent? So it's it's really hard, and I think that um, I, you know, I, I fall on the side more often of like less is more. You know, I, like when they introduced voice into Dishonored Two, I feel like it was a similar hard balance. You know, where it's like I don't. It's cool that you can talk. I don't know if you should have talked as much, but if you weren't, then why can you talk at all? And blah blah blah. Yeah. So um, I, I think it's. I mean, again, the team making Resident Evil Seven bit off a lot of hard problems uh, for, for making these kinds of games. And um, I don't know if there are like perfect solutions for them. Um, but I do find, even in the amount of played, I find the the tone to be kind of all over the place. In mm -hmm. like, it starts out really dark and kind of like impactful. And pretty soon there's some pretty wacky stuff in it. And it feels like it goes back and forth. But I also feel like that's pretty part and parcel of Resident Evil historically as well. Right? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. But, it, but it's a little bit weirder in Resident Evil 7 when the serious stuff, I think, plays more believably mm -hmm. kind of like serious and, and gritty than in prior games. So right. with gameplay, Reiner, uh, we focus a lot on the story and whatnot, but with gameplay, you mentioned the other day that there is a boss in this game that had you pulling your hair out. Mm. Is it a tough game overall, or is it just this one? It's just that one boss. It's just the one. And that's the, it, it's the sad thing, because it's pretty early in the game, and maybe I, I just, well, you you just struggled with it too, right, JV? Yeah, and Kyle did a little bit as well. Uh, uh, not quite as much as you guys, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle over here. I'm pretty can you give me a one-word, non-spoilery, like, keyword, so I can know if I played this or not? Chainsaw. Chainsaw. So you mean like the first boss? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Wait a minute. Uh, well, Wait, not like I imagine it's not like in the first hour. No, 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 no. no okay, no, there's no. that chainsaw. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah no, not no, that. No, no. Okay. All right. Uh, never mind. But yeah, there's this one fight where the rules aren't really conveyed very well, and you're gonna die a bunch on that. At least I did. Like it was like just trying to figure out patterns and and what to do in that space. And and I think that first person perspective in that fight especially kind of hinders it a little bit, and, just given the the enclosed space and there's kind of things dangling around you trying to figure out how do I take this out? And it goes on forever. I yeah. mean, I was just like, am I doing something wrong? That's, that's the thing that came up. And I think 
a lot of people might stop playing the game right there. It's which is a shame because the balance really comes really hits its its mark right after that. Yeah, it's it's weird because it's like Dark Souls in that it's glitchy and frustrating and that it's like this is a brilliant concept for like a boss fight, but then like, well, he just got me through this wall. This sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. And that happens mm. over and over and over again. I don't know if they uh. patched it or whatever, but Kyle didn't run into that problem yesterday. I mean, on I certainly stream. I certainly died and I would certainly agree with you guys that it was up to this point has been the hardest boss in the game. But it wasn't like it was more of like a I enjoyed it because it was kinda like, oh what's it was clearly like not like, oh, I need to shoot him twenty times. It was like, let me figure out what the so how I, you know, need to shoot him, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. But, so anyway. It hasn't come up once yet, but I see there's a certain faction on Twitter that's saying, if you idiots play this game not in VR, you're blowing it. You're wasting this opportunity because finally publishers swinging big with a VR release and it's the way to play. Ryan, did you check out the VR version? I did. And I enjoyed it while I was standing up and <laughs> turning in my own environment kind of okay. uh, as you would, you know, like moving around as, you, as you'd as you want to. But if you play it sitting down, the default is that you move at set angles, at 30 degree angles. So you are kind of warping, kind of snap a little you know, bit. snapping yeah. through the environment. Wait, Wait, you can like walk forward? No, no, no. Just no. You, you walk, you just walk normal speed, but when you look right, you look, you snap 30 degrees right or 30 oh, degrees left. Because when you turn step. on smooth, this is an option and they have different settings for how smooth you want to make it. Whenever I would turn in that, turn in the right analog stick to turn in VR, it, it just, it didn't feel right. It didn't feel natural. Uh, so I liked using my head to turn and being able to stand up and turn around. Because this is a game where you're, you are moving freely, right? It isn't just forward, 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 forward. You are backtracking, turning around, looking through drawers, all that stuff. Uh, so set angles, it just felt wrong. You're always thinking about that, just yeah. that jump cut. Uh, and then the smooth thing, it just, maybe it'll be better for other people out there. But for me, it was just like immediately I was like, I'm going to get sick if I keep playing this way. Like it's just not gelling. And I tried every option possible. Uh, do you get the sense though that if you if your stomach can handle it, it's going to be the way it's to play? Cool. It's cool. Yeah, if you're standing, I, like I said, I think it's cool. That's the way to play it. Well, yeah, I would disagree. I, I played for about 40 minutes last night with VR. That was about as much as I could handle. And I the second action started, like I struggled playing in VR and it made it so much harder and I was really tough. But I did like just walking around in VR. Like I was crawling under the house and have, being in VR to like look at the detail, even yeah. though it is turned down a little bit because you're looking at it through like PlayStation VR, to like just it, like not have to worry about fighting anything and just looking at stuff and seeing the detail in the environment made the house much creepier and it really sold that environment really well. But like the second I started getting chased or something like that and I'm like jumping like 30 degrees at a time to try to run away and doing quick turns and stuff like that, like I just was like, I can't do this in VR. See, that's what I'm saying. If you're standing though, because you when you when you have when you're playing in VR in combat, you are looking down the scope, or you know, like you, you do have your better shotgun. aim. Yeah. So you have better aim if you have a tight neck, I guess. You know, you sure. can aim <laughs> nicely. So I thought combat was actually a little easier in VR, uh, and headshots are no, critical. No, did in you? This. I just said you were wrong, though. Did you hear <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> yeah. Just sure. uh, yeah. So I, I mean, I thought that kind of. And the presence, yeah, you know what we say when enemies right. are getting up close and, and personal. They do that a good personal. job of that in this game, too. And There's a lot of knives being shoved in your face. <laughs> and, Ooh, it's going to touch you, that type of thing. I, <laughs> say, I am glad the option exists. Like, I'm glad they went for it. And I'm glad that I can turn it on and try it and be like, oh, that was kind of interesting. But as, <laughs> as far as, like, playing the full game like that, I just, I don't, I can't see myself doing it that way. It and sounds like you just want Gone Home in VR, Kyle. Yeah, that's. I think I've actually said that statement before. I want. I want a VR game where you can just because the coolest thing about VR to me is just like being in an environment. So a game like Gone Home, where it's all about the environment and exploring the environment. I think that would be very cool. Hey, you guys should do a VR patch. <laughs> that's easy, right? That's just like segue, yeah. Kyle. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. I mean, you know, just hit click the VR just button. Put Tacoma on pause and like, yeah, I've I've seen those uh, options in Steam. Did Did any of you guys play on PC? No, no. Uh, I started on PC. Yeah. Okay, because I'm playing on PC with mouse and keyboard, and it actually works really well. Like, talking about the precision of VR giving you better aim, like, the initial setting, like, the sensitivity settings and stuff, I needed to tweak with a fair amount um, for the PC version, because I think it was very tuned to feel more like a gamepad, like, your turn radius is mm -hmm. really slow and stuff. But once you just adjust the sensitivity, it's just like any highly responsive first-person shooter, and, um, I, yeah, I feel like the game would be a lot, well... 
I've like I've I've never been like a ultra you know uh, a prestiging COD player or anything, right? So like my like gamepad FPS skills are probably not what a lot of people's are, but um, with a game like this that requires precision. And, you know, you need to, like, get every headshot or you're out of bullets and where you do want to be able to, like, turn around quickly and get the f*** out. Um, I found that uh, they did a really, really good job with the mouse keyboard inputs, actually, and they, they play play well to being effective in the game, I think. Nice. I didn't even think about that idea of you can yeah. now play Resident Evil like Counter-Strike on a PC. What a weird <laughs> yeah. world. God. Yeah. Right now, no, I was worried about it because I was like, are they going to nail you know pre pc fps controls for this but i i feel like it it feels really great wow Ryan, where'd you end up giving this game 8.5 out of 10 and i think that is a great foundation for a series moving forward like i said earlier like i i really do think there's a lot of room to grow uh some mistakes they made along the way i think they can iron those out in another, another one i hope they get another shot at it uh yeah. the same formula but maybe not uh you know with like jv's parents or whatever as your as the nemesis <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> you dick. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Steve, uh, we're, we're sad to let you go. You're welcome back on the show at any point. Just call up you know, our Skype name at any point. We'll patch into the show whenever we're recording. But you want to give a plug? What are you working on? When's Tacoma coming out? Uh, Tacoma's coming out later this year. We're going to be um, showing it at a couple of events in San Francisco around GDC. And then we'll have more info after that. Cool. But you can go to a Tacoma game dot com or follow Tacoma Game on on Twitter to find out more about what we're doing. Right on, and, uh, cool. VR for Gone Home, like Kyle. Weeks, please maybe. don't. He has <laughs> enough on his plate working on Tacoma already. <laughs> I'm busy. I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta right, be Steve. Resident Evil. Right. Thanks for your time, Later, man. Steve. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Me on. It was great to talk to you guys. All right, take care. See ya. Right. Goodbye, Steve. Bye, Bye Steve. He's but now, home. now we're talking <laughs> about Ghost Recon Wildlands. I guess he was at home actually. JV, this is the game that Ubisoft showed off at E3, where it looked like. You can do everything. People are flying in on helicopters. Mm. You're invading these homes in the middle of the biggest open world ever created. It seems very ambitious. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's technically true, but certainly the way Ubisoft was framing it, it looks gigantic. So right. what is it like to actually play this thing? Okay, so my biggest concern with uh, Ghost Recon Wildlands, because I haven't really talked that much about it yeah. in like the two years they've like been showing it off. Has it been two years? I think they showed it off like two years ago. Maybe yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But anyway, it's my big concern was I heard open world, co-op, four-player. I was like, well, this is going to be The Division, but in Bolivia. And I started playing it. I thought I was expecting like a very Destiny Division sort of thing. And I started playing it, and nope, it actually plays like a combination of Metal Gear Solid Five and Splinter Cell Blacklist, but in a huge open world. That sounds really good. Yeah. It's really good. I like, I like good. both those games. Yeah, it's really, really good. And it's I not... Def I definitely got Metal Gear vibes like early on, like from when they were first showing it. Yeah, it, and it plays... Pretty much like that. Like it's so it's Metal Gear Survive. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Metal Gear Bolivia. Yeah. Uh, but I got to play specifics. I went to a preview event and I got to play four hours of it. The first two hours I was on my own with like my AI companions doing the opening missions of the game, and then we got to spend uh, time playing multiplayer with actual like people, people uh, as my squad mates for like two hours late game, and it was like night and day. Uh, because your AI companions are competent, and basically the thrust of the game is you're like doing basically what you do in Metal Gear Solid Five. You're going into camps, you're taking out camps, you're rescuing, or you're getting intel, you're interrogating uh, certain soldiers. And it's one seamless open world. It's where you one just have seamless missions, open world. Like, exactly. Like yeah, yeah. Okay. And I and I only got to play with uh because Bolivia is divided up, and in real life and in the game into regions, and we got to play with one of the smaller regions. But even because I spent four hours with it, even with one of the smaller regions, I felt like I only saw like maybe half of that land mass. And I was going everywhere. That's like, my it, biggest concern with the game is every time I've seen it demoed, that open world looks so boring. It's it's like, here's a dried up lake. But if it is it like Metal Gear where, yeah, it's kind of boring, but it doesn't matter. It's just a backdrop but that's at least, technically there. Yeah, Metal Gear has the fantastical elements that you don't know are, you know, are going to pop up. Whereas this is like, okay, rundown village, we're going to take typical vehicles in everyday, you know, USA and the world and use AK-47, stuff like that. I mean, what is what is the will, connection I to that say, world that's interesting? I that's will, the one thing I'm struggling with. Whenever I look at it, I'm like, I like what they're saying cooperatively and the gameplay stuff, but that world just doesn't do it for me. No, And, that's, and the setup doesn't do it for me. That's, that's totally fair because 
whenever I play an open world game or see one that's coming out and you know, you have a developer bragging about, well, my game is bigger than last year's open world game. It's just like, come on, fellas. You Our know, disc is twice as big. Yeah, it's it's kind of ridiculous because so often these worlds are, are pretty empty. And it was pretty funny because one of the lead designers there was uh, telling us about the game before we sat down to play it. And he did the Todd Howard thing of, you see this mountain, you can scale it. You can go there. Like, that is exactly what he said. Did the same thing, but... Did he wink at least? Are developers nope. aware? No. Nope. He <laughs> that we've wink. heard it a thousand times? They're it is all, weak. They're all too busy working on their own games to see other people's marketing pitches, I think. But I will say that, I mean, there are a lot of empty spaces, but you go to a camp, right? And it might be in the jungle. It might be near a lake. It might be on the ridge of a mountain. Um... And what the landscape does is it offers you different tactical approaches because so often like you'll come across a camp and there's like a peak over it. So, okay, I'll go here and my teammates will fan out. I'll have two guys coming from the south, another guy coming from the north, and it'll be me sniping from atop and sending my drones in to tag. And you get, you know, little portable drones you can send in to like tag enemies, sort of like you can do in Splinter Cell uh, and tag enemies in the camp so that they know where they are when they're going in there. And I can snipe them and provide assistance, uh, or I can go fetch a vehicle. I can fly a helicopter in to extract them when things get hot, uh, you know, or I can like go and find a minigun in the camp for when enemy reinforcements show up, which often includes like a tank or a helicopter just showing up and raining hellfire down on you and your, uh, your buddies. So there's like a lot of tactical options there and it's really fun. And it feels like the best thing I can say about it is so often like side missions, especially in Ubisoft open world games, just feel like chores mm -hmm. like that you're doing to unlock skills or buy equipment or whatever. But in Ghost Recon Wildlands, everything that I did felt like its own little short story where me mm. and the people I was playing with were the stars. It's that very much emergent storytelling thing that was. But is it the same story over and over of just like. We're going in this camp. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, but there's but still like a, a lot of room there. Like, there's still, you know, procedurally, yeah. it's how you take it, and there are exciting moments that erupt from that. You know, there's like, okay, well, like, we're in a fix here. Our plan has gone to shit. We have to, you know, plan moment by moment how we're going to get out of this mess. And that happens a lot. And, like, honestly, it's just as much fun when you fail, when things fall apart, as it is to, like, succeed, like, to get on the helicopter at the last second and get out of there. Do you think it feels like Ghost Recon? I don't know if you're a series fan, but is it just open world aside, once you get down to the tactical decisions, it feels like that type of game? I mean, I played Ghost Recon when it came out, and when it first came out, it was like an offshoot of Rainbow Six, so it was super hardcore into tactical stuff, like one shot, you're dead. Yeah. So no, this one feels more like a spiritual successor that keeps the ideas of Ghost Recon in mind, and that it's, okay, this is a spec ops game, but you have a massive world, that you can work with because when Ghost Recon the original one came out it wasn't technically open world per se but it was more like it was more like Halo and that oh my god these spaces are huge and yeah. I have a lot to work with it was the illusion of open world um but here like it's much more action focused than tactical like you can take eight hits before you go down in a fight uh and just like a real human body <laughs> one two three four five but that's but that's not to say one of the things I was super worried about why I was talking about Destiny and uh, the division beforehand is I do not like bullet sponge enemies at yeah. all usually especially when they're humans which is why I don't play the division because you know if there's a plumber coming at me and I shoot him in the face and he doesn't go down there's no reason for that it's just well this is an RPG this is what we expect mm -hmm. plumbers are tough too man mm -hmm. well Mario's taught us that don't but, play any SpongeBob games by the way <laughs> but uh, in in Wildlands the combat is super satisfying because it is semi-realistic. If you shoot pretty much anyone above the chest, and where, unless they're wearing like super hard armor, and even then, those guys go down with like three or four hits, uh, that person's going to go down. Like it's tactical, so it's super fun to have, you know, all your guys pointed at a small enemy encampment. Each of you has a shot on one enemy, and then someone says go, and you all fire, and all those enemies go down. Like it's like exactly like a movie sequence you might see in the Expendables or something. So it's. It's those moments that are super satisfying. So you're coming out pretty hyped for this game. Yeah, it's like I went in super, understand I went in with low expectations yeah. because they haven't really told us anything about it outside of like, you know, some hands-on that Burt's got like at E3 last year or the year before. And even that was a snippet. But I came away like four hours nonstop 
playing this game going, I want, I don't want to leave my station. I don't want to go on a plane and get back to Minnesota. I want to stay here and just keep on playing. So it's probably my most hyped game for like the early part of the year. Yeah, and it's coming out in March. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's right around the corner. Yeah. Uh, and actually, oh, wait, is it March or February? It's March. Okay. Yeah. And they actually just announced the closed beta uh, a couple of hours ago. So that's coming up soon too. Wow. All right. Cool. Wild lines, everybody. Uh, real quick, Overwatch, Capture the Rooster, update, year of the rooster, Chinese uh, New Year, uh, a whole event. So, Li Zhang Towers have been reskinned, and now they added, in the arcade mode specifically, a Capture the Flag type mode. After a lot of fans have been asking for it for so long, they finally released it. Reiner, what do you think of it? I've played it twice, okay, great. poorly. Uh-huh. Uh, it's a really small map for Capture the Flag. It's yeah. like... My first game, it was like, the opposing team has your flag. And I'm like, what's happening? You know, where is it? And it's like, flag captured. And I was like, whoa, did you just round the corner and he's done? Some like, of those are really close. It's yeah, also so, funny, like, I found myself reflexively just going to those control points on that map because I've done it so many times. Yeah. And it's like, oh, wait, there's nothing here. It's just an empty <laughs> room now. How does? Are you limited by the characters you can play as? Or? No. no. Okay, so you can so, play as everybody. And yeah. isn't it a rooster instead of a flag? Or I is guess that just technically a it's, it's, a flag. It's, it's just a flag. Even the icons They're just flags. trying to be cutesy. Uh, but it is a new way, like you just pointed out, a new way to play this old map, you know, like, and, yeah. and uh, yeah, I'd like to see what they could do with it on maybe a little bit of the bigger environments where there's a little bit more real estate to maybe have strategy set up in places. This one's, this map they're using, the towers, is, uh-huh. is kind of confusing that capacity. Like I said, I only played it twice, mm-hmm. uh, but it really seems like this is all about communication, more so than the, the base game where we got to be defensive or offensive or, you know, like, you really got to strategize to get that flag or protect your your base. This is, uh, I think the art's awesome. I think the new skins look fantastic. I want that May more than I want oxygen in my lungs. But I think this is the first Overwatch update. Switch those priorities a little bit. How's that? Just flip. But this is the first Overwatch update where I've played it and it's like, I I don't know if I care for this. I don't know if I like it. Uh, First off, this is a small complaint. The new spray interface where you can choose four. Yes. It makes it slower to spray, and you have to add a direction. So I found myself not being quite as precise for where I'm putting my sprays. It's yep. a small UI change. I think on PC it's better, but it's really annoying. I uh, just want can, the quick up button spray. Yeah, I found you can do it at the same time. Like you got to hit both. You got to hit up on the D pad and then the the spray button I at the same time. Right, right on the analog, or they patch this, it in. I hate this it. just seems like the most like Seinfeld episode. No, no, like, it's, the spray. it's the spray. But yeah. the thing I I thought they were doing was allowing you to put four different tags up in the environment at a given time. But that's not the case. You could put up one, and then if you switch to another one, it replaces the one you put right. up. Otherwise, they don't. Because I was going to go graffiti. nuts. <laughs> yeah, it would have been amazing. <laughs> have, all those people <laughs> just doing that. Have you guys ever done a spray outside of that introductory room? Oh yeah! Every really? time, every time I think I might have played the game, I spray the ground like a cool yep. boy. And oh. <laughs> and okay, like yeah, a cool I do boy. that. I do that or the hello move. And then uh, anytime um, you're escorting something, the the car with the the fist, doom fist or whatever, sure. his his fist on there, you could put your spray right on the hood there. <laughs> Yeah, you put sprays and everywhere. Everybody Sorry, sees I just, it. I thought it was only for that introductory it's room. It's just uh-huh. an art game. Kyle, I'm with you. I'm no. with you. <laughs> but this is this is the minor thing. The big yeah, yeah. thing is capture the flag in Overwatch. And like I watched uh, Jeff Kaplan, the game director's video on YouTube uh, ahead of time, and I think it's a really interesting take. He's he has a very good perspective on it where he even acknowledges like this is we prototype this even before we announce the game. Like we've been talking about capture the flag forever, obviously, but we didn't want to do it because it's the only objective in overwatch then where things are split yeah. usually it's attack or defend control the entire team can focus it's the first one where it's making it a little bit more complicated and you have to split your team in two between defending That's and attacking. exactly it yeah and also he really set it up uh talking about you know we tried to make it because it's really tough with all these different character abilities so that it doesn't break the game like at first they had it so tracer could just come in grab the flag and then rewind and it's like well who can defend against that it's absurd so there's a build up there's like a timer that takes a while to capture but he even said like yeah you know winston with his leap like there are characters that are going to be super effective it's a lot of reinhardt defending it's a lot of symmetric things but he was key to point out like look we understand it's not a competitive mode it's an arcade it'll always be an arcade we have no intention of ever bringing it to quick play or competitive if we ever bring it back in the future different maps flesh it out it'll always be just an arcadey thing that is kind of broken okay yeah so my question is as someone who 
The only capture the flag I've ever actually liked is like the classic Team Fortress 2 2 Fort one. And that's more because of level design than anything else. Like as someone who just doesn't give a damn about capture the flag. Like when I saw the trailer for that, I just eyes glazed over. And that's weird because I love Overwatch. Like I really do. Like, is there any point? Like, is there any like there is. deviation yeah. from like regular capture the flag, or is it still the same sort of boring rhythm? I don't well, know. The bo- I think the characters and the abilities make it so it defends, yep. okay. uh, defies that boring rhythm. Yeah, it's I also think... a rooster now. <laughs> that's, Kyle. Kyle, that's not that's not a selling point, buddy. Uh, oh, okay. No, I think just the character dynamics, as Hanson is saying, is is that makes that game just so much more dynamic than your even it even though it is your basic capture the okay. flag concept. Each. No matter who's on the battlefield, it's going to change what's happening. Right? Okay, that's yeah. fair. And and this is also so early. I mean, it was basically chaos when I was playing it a fair amount last night, just a, one night of playing, and it was the first day. And so, I mean, I'm sure strategies are going to build up. I'm sure it's going to get more interesting before the time the whole event's over and whatnot. But out of the gate, uh, I want May Snowball fight back. Like, that was actually a really yeah. interesting little yeah. mode, even well, though it eventually got broke. But That's the thing I was going to say is they can use these kind of seasonal events to bounce new ideas off the the player base, and then if it doesn't work, just get rid of it. Right? Totally, like I love that. I just want an archive of the seasonal events. I want to go be able to play May Snowball thing because that yeah. was so cool. And like, oh, man, I want those costumes I didn't get or the outfits that I didn't get. Mm-hmm. And oh, ah, yeah. that's that's the big allure is opening the loot crate, uh, loot chests in this, and and just please get me a new skin or emote or whatever. I'm pretty sure Blizzard will find a way to monetize that desire. My question is, Halloween comes around next year yeah, or this year. Are they going to have all new ones or will the old ones be available? I bet it's again? Why not both? Yeah, I bet. Well, that's what both. I'm wondering. Yeah. Like, are they going to keep these things as like, you got to play. You got to keep playing if, if you but miss out. But four years for that Olympic stuff is going to take forever because I want some <laughs> of that stuff back now too. Uh, I really think I, I think all the fans were expecting Valentine's Day. They wanted an update where it's just uh, Soldier seventy six and Roadhog going to town on each other and whatnot. But I think it's interesting. Uh, what? Anyways, <laughs> I'm just saying I think it's interesting that they choose the Chinese New Year as the event. I don't think anybody expected it. Maybe people more culturally aware than myself maybe saw it coming. But it's a cool angle. I think it's a. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, it's a I nice it's global good. perspective. And it, yeah, it ties into because I feel like Overwatch has always had this sort of diverse focus. And it's nice that they're like just bringing in all these sorts mm-hmm. of you know global events. Like Even within Farah and Rogue, Roadhog specific cultures, it's diverse and that it's all over the map. But like, is she a Native American or Egyptian? What is going on? Mm-hmm. Uh, but it is cool mm-hmm. uh, to but, just have an overall Chinese vibe to this thing. But all right, that's capture the rooster, everybody, and the big uh, the big update for Overwatch. But right for now, do you guys want to move on to community emails? Well, let's yeah, do let's it. Do it. And welcome back to the Game Informer Show. We got some great emails from the community. These intelligent people, these lovely people, probably the prettiest people I'll never see and would love to see. They sent an email into podcast at GameInformer.com saying they had some feedback, they had some thoughts, they had questions, they paid attention to the gaming world and said, you know, this has always bugged me. This one thing. Straight into podcast at GameInformer.com. We're going to read them all off. We're all going to remember every email. Do not forget that we're going to choose our definitive favorite at the end. It's going to be unanimous. Only unanimous votes count. And then we're going to ship that person out the best prize they've ever received in their life. Vantax ear, right? Correct. It is one human ear. I kind of want that, actually. Everybody does. Would you put it on a necklace or what? what? I just throw it away. I'd shove it up my butt. Uh, Blake (laughs) writes in and says, hey, guys, just started listening and love the show. In the episode previewing the most anticipated games of 2017, I didn't hear a lot for PlayStation later in the year. Do you think titles such as Days Gone and Death Stranding, maybe Last of Us 2, that were shown at E3 in 2016 will come out this fall? No. 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 <laughs> that's, that's we won't why. see Death Stranding for like a decade. That's why we didn't <laughs> list them, is that their future is uncertain and we don't see them as 2017. And one Sony game we forgot to mention that is 2017, in theory, that's so far below the radar. I feel like in order to be on the radar, people need to see a blip, right? There needs to be a blip on the radar. This is just like an amorphous atmospheric haze that is dreams from Media Molecule. <laughs> I'm more game? interested in that than Days Gone By or whatever oh that is. Is that right? God. I might be too. Get I'm just here. saying Dreams is very confusing and there's not much enthusiasm for it right now, but it, it could game. be really cool. Yeah. It looks neat. I want to see what pretty. people do with it. I don't know if I want to play with it. but Yeah, it's a weird sculpting game. And I'm, I'm guessing they're retooling it for VR. They haven't talked about it since PSVR even. Gross. Mm. Come on. Gross. Really? You don't want a cool, pretty sculpting game? No. 
<laughs> okay. No. Oh. Also, as far as feedback, uh, I got an email from Ben from Wisconsin and Connor from Boston, who both wrote in talking about how Super Smash Brothers time matches are the only way to go. So I'm sorry that there's a terrible disease eating their brains. Uh, our <laughs> condolences go out to Ben and Connor. No, it, it is interesting. Both of them lined out like, hey, if you're playing with people that aren't great, play the time matches, then everyone can keep playing the entire time. There is a sane reason, but I just don't care to hear it. But thank you for writing in. <laughs> um, Brendan Smith writes in and says, I was listening to your discussion of the Switch last week and something Ben Reeves said struck a bit of a nerve. He was talking about arms and how he wasn't feeling it and he wondered why it couldn't be another Punch-Out game. It seems to me that people are always wanting something different from what Nintendo actually releases. Uh, they make a game that could have been a new IP, and they call it Metroid Federation Force, and fans explode with rage because it's not the real thing. Then they make a game with colorful new IP and unique mechanics, arms, and fans complain that it's not punch out. Is there anything Nintendo can do to legitimately strike a better balance between old and new, or are they destined to keep taking criticism from both directions forever? I think that's like literally every company is destined to take criticism from both directions forever it might be particularly intense with a nintendo but like that's just a thing i feel like yes they're always going to get crap there's an extra layer of crap when people connect it to their childhood nostalgia yeah it's like anything it's the old we were just talking about it at, at lunch today but the duck duck goose versus duck duck gray duck minnesota argument people are <laughs> passionate about it because it's from their childhood i had the same reaction jb when i first heard of duck duck like, gray duck. what it's wait you've the never heard this it's you duck duck goose in minnesota we, we see duck duck gray duck refer, we refer to the proper name <laughs> but the reason the, the preferred nomenclature exactly the reason Thank this is such Jamie. a passionate debate because like that's my childhood you're talking about my childhood isn't wrong <laughs> and it's the same with this that's why those nintendo fans are so up in arms like that's and, not my metroid well the thing i'll say about this is you should have smacked ben reeves around like anytime there's a new IP, a new experience coming, leave it be. If it's a unique thing, that's fine. But Metroid, on the other hand, mm -hmm. that was something that was very different. And they put Metroid on it and tried to turn Metroid into something else. Right. right. I, I feel like also and that's, people have like something they want for Metroid. Sorry, JP, but no, they they have a very definitive edition what Metroid should be. Mm -hmm. This is just like sports ball league. Like, what the hell is that? Thing? And well, it's just like people were looking at that and going, this is bad. And then it came out and guess what? It was bad. I, it's I not, just reject that notion that it's bad. I think yeah. Kyle's with it's, me. It's, it's, it's not interesting. good. I think. How much have you played? I played about an hour of it with Shay. Right. Okay. Yeah, I didn't care for it. I still feel like from a high direction, clearly from Nintendo on high, they looked down at next level games and said, make us this type of game. We're going to call it Metroid. I feel like on those bullet points, next level delivered as almost as best they could within that format. I understand there's some frustrations later on in the game with the way it's laid out yeah. and whatnot. There are elements of the game where it feels like a handheld Metroid Prime at times. The way it plays, you're giving me this look. It's like the I don't way, know if I'd the way say it that. controls, you know, like it, it sure. controls like a Metroid Prime. And real quick, to Reeves' point like earlier, I don't know if he necessarily wished Arms was Punch-Out so much as he just felt like it was punch out and didn't understand why the license wasn't applied it's not that he was like oh i wish this was punch out it was more this seems like it should be punch out mm, maybe i mean to his <laughs> point then <laughs> i don't remember exactly how he phrased it but uh, i just think back to that classic nintendo thing of whenever they do give fans their fan service there's like four tweets of people being like hurrah and then everybody moves on like they finally gave us mother zero has anybody talked about it since no uh, Okay, they finally gave us well, the Kid Well, they released in the middle sequel. of E3, to be Okay, fair. but Kid Icarus sequel, right? And yeah. there's there's a lot to love about that game, even if your hand doesn't get cramped. People just barely cared. They released an awesome version of Punch-Out on the Wii. People barely cared. And you could not deliver on that formula better than Punch-Out on the Wii. Yeah. Anyways, uh, so yes, people are, or Nintendo's cursed forever. Uh, Brendan, thank you for writing. <laughs> uh, Jake, Z, Jake, yeah, Jake Z says, Hi guys, do you think the Switch would eventually have Jackbox or similar games that have players use their phones to play? Maybe Nintendo could make their own version of Jackbox Party Pack. What are your thoughts on this? Seems feasible. Okay. Well, sure. I mean, it's going to have a it's going to have phone connectivity out of the box to begin with, right? And I mean, if it becomes popular, then yeah, Jackbox. If if a million know. people have switches and they're like, yeah, this is a good party machine, like yeah, of course Jackbox will appear on there. Those are such graphically intensive games. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just don't know how they could pull that off on Switch. How are they going to render that yeah. stuff? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder because if they have some sort of drawing game or something, they would want you just to pass around yeah. the actual Switch. Well, I think just pad, the fact right? that it, well, I guess you couldn't. In a way, it can almost be split apart into three controllers out of the box. Like you have the two controllers and then the touchscreen. Like it seems like that could lead to interesting party games. But remember, you know? the touchscreen is the screen if you remove it. Yeah, but you could still work that into 
game mechanics. Like two people can be con- controlling, doing something with the controllers while a third player is interacting on the screen. You know? I have a better idea for Jake. And I pitched the Jackbox guys on this in our test chamber for the third party pack. Let those guys make the next Mario Party. Mm. Just take that formula. Let people use their phones. Just reboot Mario Party and make it fun. <laughs> make Mario Party good again. Oh, that's too much. That's to an ask. interesting. It's idea. a good Making idea. It fun. <laughs> you kind of cut off their humor, though. You know what I mean? Like, because Mario's humor is very different. Yeah, you can make and a lot of vague so boner jokes about Bowser. I guess, <laughs> if you really need to. Bowser boners. Oh man. Uh, <laughs> Forrest Lastman writes in and says, "Hey, GI crew, what was the most in-depth look at a studio?" that a studio has ever given you into the development of a game? Which has been the most open to you in showing off how the game was created? Do studios tend to hide and cover up potential leaks when you visit, or are they generally open? Uh, That's a great question. It varies very much developer to developer, publisher to publisher, PR wrangler to PR wrangler. So there's these three intersecting waves, and when everything aligns just right, then you can get a really good look at a game. Um, I think of like Saints Row 3, I think they're really open. Reiner, you're on that one with me, but way back in the day. Yeah, I mean, they let us play around with a, a prototyped material that didn't even make it into the game. We were just kind of free running around in the city, looking at stuff that we weren't supposed to. Obviously, you know, then, then that's where PR is like, oh, no, don't talk about this stuff. But uh, I think the one that really stood out the most is going to Naughty Dog and seeing Uncharted 4. Mm-hmm. Like they, they brought us in this theater, their, their inner studio theater. We watched like a 15 minute demo and then that was it. Then we had an interview, but then they're like, why don't you guys just come watch us make the game and get it stripped all the way down to the barest essentials of polygons and shapes. And then we saw how it all came together. We walked from desk to desk, yeah. going artist to artist, and they all talked to us about their processes, what they're doing, how they're improving on things. And we saw every intimate detail of that went into the world and the characters. I mean, I kid you not, like, every yeah. little layer on top of it lighting effect all that and there's always little things like i remember looking over at other screens as far as like what they try and cover up sometimes they do put like big posters over like you know because they usually have like story charts on the wall stuff like that they don't want to spoil that but other times people are cooler and they'll just be like I, almost every studio visit there's a moment of eh, just be cool don't look over there <laughs> and it's like okay we're not gonna look over there or we will glimpse quickly like with uncharted 4 like i remember seeing <laughs> <laughs> on someone's monitor, like, you know, you saw Nathan Drake in, like, a tux. Yeah. And so it's like, well, I'm not going to well, write about that, but we know there's probably something, and then that ended up being the the whole auction level. And every desk at Naughty Dog, they have, like, their development monitor, and then they have this vertical monitor that's, like, their schedule for the studio. Yeah. And as you're sitting there, like, watching them do something, you'll see, like, something pop up over here, and it's like, oh, they're working on that level. <laughs> you know, like, right, or, oh, right. here are certain things in the game. It's like... You should turn those monitors off. Yeah. But it's it's I'm like, cool. What a scoop. Yeah, it's just there's a certain level of trust. Of like, you know, like yeah. we know you're not gonna just write down every detail you see in this blast to spoil you don't know the game what it's for everybody. With. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Uh but as far as like I always being the video guy, there's a next level where there's something about developers being open, but then also open to cameras. And so I remember High Moon uh on Transformers Fall of Cybertron. Not only were they one of like the nicest studios. But so open, like, yeah, just go ahead and set up your camera. Go ahead and film us. And it got, there's one video we posted where it's just insane. Where it's like, okay, here's Optimus Prime walking through this environment. This is Unreal Engine 3. Here you can see how we're layering out or like laying out the trigger volumes for Optimus Prime. Just as nitty gritty as you can get. And it's that extra level of sweet when they let you film that kind of stuff for the nerds, you know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And then 15 was just a crazy week. Yeah, being in Japan at Square. Yeah. That, that was incredibly thorough, but does anything stand out to you guys? I really, uh, when you were talking about PR people going, no, no, don't do this, I didn't really <laughs> liked our coalition trip. Oh, sure. When we went there, and uh, one of the PR people, like that, we were walking through the bullpen, and they had on the wall a list of every weapon that was in the game, and a, one of the PR people, like, pointed to another one and they ran over and threw like a sheet on it. <laughs> and he saw me and saw that I'd seen it. He was like, don't write about that. <laughs> Please, just be cool. But like, it wasn't like any surprise. Like all the weapons that you knew were going to be in the game, that was all that was up there. On that note, you know what's underrated? Mm. Uh, and you're a man who can appreciate this. In the beginning of Titanfall 2's campaign, okay, I'm already when you're in like the little VR simulation, they're teaching you how to do the wall running. Mm-hmm. And then they just say, hey, and here's all of our guns. And then oh, it's just... Like the entire arsenal through yes. the game, right? And I think they even say that it's not every gun, but it's such a good moment. Just like whatever here take a look at this it'll look Play. cool grab yeah, anyone yeah. you want and have a good yeah, time yeah it sets the tone for the game oh it so does much really so. good job 
Uh, let's see. Oh, also Forrest writes in with something I don't quite understand. Maybe you guys can. He says, also, since you wanted more technical questions, what style guide does Game Informer use? Who in the office enforces the guide strictest? We we use what, AP. A- AP. Yeah. Yeah. AP, Chicago, Rhinarian, <laughs> Bertzerian. Cork has we a basically book on just yell at everyone our opinions of how things and should be. And if we don't if we don't arrive at a consensus, we just consensus consent consensus. We ask Bert's and he uh, gives us a consensus. Uh, <laughs> he consensorizes us. And <laughs> it's just it's great. Moving on. Right. There, there is a Star Wars section in our style guide. <laughs> that someone on staff put together. What is it? Was it you? It's a full... You I, I kid you it? not, there's like hundreds of Star Wars items in there. Did, did you put it together? I, I cannot confirm or deny anything. What do you mean the Star Wars say. items? <laughs> like here's there is how... a full section in our style guide dedicated just to Star Wars. Like how we write out... Spell Do names, we capitalize Jedi? Jedi that type is of thing? plural. That, all that. Right, yeah. I'll be damned. I had no idea. Yeah. Um, let's see. Travis from Lionel Lakes, Minnesota. God's Country says, Hey, GI nerds. I, Offended, sir. If you could choose one game studio to move to Minnesota and work near your office, who would you choose? Some things to consider. You could hang out with them outside of work, show them around the Twin Cities. <laughs> we could be their tour guides, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you would have easy and probably exclusive access to all of their future development. However, they might egg your office or something if you give them a bad review. I don't know if full access is dependent on geography uh, <laughs> yeah. for different outlets, but you got to go Valve, right? Or oh, that's a good one. Blizzard. I want machine games. Machine games. What? Uh, I'm just okay. answering the you question. Just want to peek through their windows. Jeez. Just want to go. Like, uh, you got to go. Studio how's Wolfenstein going, guys? Right. Yeah. I mean, you think yeah. studios that do a lot. You think of the big three, the greatest of all time: Blizzard, Valve, and Machine <laughs> Games. <laughs> That's Let's put Nintendo answer. next I'm door to, to it. Yeah, Ninten- all of Nintendo. Well, yeah, yeah. they probably have like a nice Nintendo store in their lobby. Can go get a nice shirt. Oh man, time. just think of the purchasing oh, God, opportunities. So many shirts. Uh, Kyle would go poor. Like every time he got his check, he would just go live uh, in mean, the Nintendo uh, store. It's funny because today I have a logo on my shirt, but I never wear put logos on any of my shirts, so I probably would never buy a shirt there. Scott from Minnesota also writes in and he says, Good afternoon. I recently played through Call of Duty's newest game, Infinite Warfare. Uh, Reiner mentioned he liked it more than Titanfall 2, so I decided to play it. After beating <laughs> it, I was very satisfied. I like the idea of Scott just leaning back in his chair. I am satisfied. <laughs> that is the worst face I've ever seen. It's, it's, it's Jamie. Are you all right? Are you having a really stroke there? What's going on? Anyways, he says, one of my favorite Call of Duty campaigns ever. My question is, will Call of Duty ever be able to get its image back and how so? This struck me because there was a post on Reddit the other day where it's like every Call of Duty ever. And then it just had some snarky image or something. It's like, I... I feel weird defending Call of Duty, but Infinite Warfare, I feel like, took a lot of chances, and I don't feel like Infinity Ward has gotten the credit they deserved yet for how bold that campaign is. Yeah. Uh, so if Infinite Warfare doesn't knock people mentally out of the rut of every Call of Duty campaign is the same, what will? I'm a year off. Oh, yeah, Assassin's Creed a year off. Okay. Yeah. How about so. you enter this house? Oh. You don't have any weapons. I'm okay. listening. All right. Your wife is there, maybe. Uh, oh, what's her uh, name? Maybe. What's her name? I don't know. Mia, Kia. Mia, Kia, something. <laughs> Mia, Kia. <laughs> Mia, Kia. And it looks like it might be a ghost story. Ooh. And then explosions, Call of Duty. Turns out it's a Call of Duty ghost story. <laughs> I do. It, it is kind of disheartening, though, because even though I didn't love Infinite Warfare as much as I love Titanfall 2, because Titanfall 2 is an objectively better game. Correct. Um, I did appreciate it. I did appreciate the risks. Uh, I don't really, I don't know. I've always sort of brushed uh, against that notion that every Call of Duty game is the same because they're not, they fit in the same box, but every game's different and the, the development teams making them take different risks yeah. thematically or you know mechanics-wise. So, And it's not even necessarily a bad thing that Call of Duty has the image that it does because it's still, regardless of what people say, it's still like the biggest franchise. Like the, at least the biggest shooter franchise. Yeah, shooter. It was, it was yeah. at the top of the MPD last yeah. month, I think. Right? The, yeah. Yeah. I mean, don't take this wrong, but they're both fantastic campaigns. You should play both of these games. They are neck and neck. But I just liked what they did in Call of Duty. Like they you like space, yeah, yeah, and just huge like uh, capital class ships over your head at all times, and the sequences just no, mind blowing. Yeah. But I thought Titanfall Two had the better moments, like individual moments. I think it had. Wow, that was super clever. That level was cool. 
But as a collective whole, I thought I really appreciated what Call of Duty did. Yeah, I Certainly like storytelling in Call yeah, of Duty. Yeah, yeah, I like Call of Duty when it shamelessly steals from other things. Like <laughs> Infinite Warfare and Black Ops 2 shamelessly steal from Mass Effect 2. And those are why those games are my favorite out of that whole series. Hmm. Jamie's like, Space, where have I seen that before? <gasps> Mass Effect! No, you know, it does. And Mass Effect it's it's the Mass loyalty Effect is missions, totally though. original. It's, it's the loyalty <laughs> missions. Uh, remember, Sledgehammer's coming up next with... The last game was Advanced Warfare, so you'd imagine it's Advanced Warfare 2. Seems like I'm they so pumped for that. If that's her. how it is. If that's what it is. But there's also rumors because they tweeted out, I forget what the holiday was. Maybe it was like New Year's or around Christmas. But they tweeted out this image that looked a little old timey. And so fans were losing their minds. Like, are they going back to World War II? Is it going to be Sledgehammer after all? But it seems like that foundation was too rich for Advanced War- Warfare to abandon after one. Let's I, think about this Ghosts left off on a huge cliffhanger. They just abandoned that. I yeah. mean, they really did. They oh, just yeah. said, this didn't do well enough. Fans didn't like it enough. Let's move on. Advanced Warfare was a success, but it seems like this future setting might not be hitting so hard like they were hoping. So, yeah, we'll see if yeah, they but, continue on or if they maybe go back like Battlefield 1. But we're you have to take into account however long they've been working on that game, though. Close so, to three years now, right? Yeah, yeah, so, you know, if they were doing sci-fi back then, I don't think they're necessarily going to scrap it. Just All you do is hit a button, <laughs> new and old. New assets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On the development station, just new. You literally time future. travel. It's right next to the VR button. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that Steve was talking yeah. about. <laughs> Michael from St. Paul, Minnesota. A lot of Minnesota folks. Thank you. Uh, right, and says, hey there, GI. Are any of you fans of Twin Peaks or David Lynch in general? Are you looking forward to the new season this year? What's your favorite David Lynch movie? I'm a big Lynch fan. My favorite might be Inland Empire. Even Kill though, JV's Even Mike. though that's an unpopular choice. <laughs> Do not let JV respond to this. <laughs> Why? Because the, the sort of, you will not stop talking. The, what? Are you a huge David Lynch guy? No. Well, I mean, I, I like for David sure Lynch. you would be. I, I like Twin Peaks. I like the first season of Twin Peaks, but then Twin Peaks season two happens and it's garbage. Is yeah. it worth watching right the first, the and then is it going to be weird just to cut yourself off before season two? Uh, I mean, it's one of those things where, like, unless you are deeply invested in everything, within, like, three or four episodes into season two, you're going to get bored. Yeah. Um, what if we really only want to watch Twin Peaks because you heard that the developers of Link's Awakening were inspired by it, and you really like the tone of Link's Awakening? Is that enough Sure, go ahead. Record? Okay. Yeah. That's it? Um, but favorite movie? Oh, that's. I feel like it's an easy answer, but I mean, you gotta go Racerhead, right? Racer no, not cool. a I don't think that's head. gonna be. I think Blue Velvet is probably yeah. gonna be the I easy seen answer. Velvet. I really Blue like Velvet Racerhead. Blue easy Velvet's answer. a good yeah. one. Um, I've only seen Mulholland Drive. David Lynch is this huge void yeah. in my film history. I always get him confused with the lead singer of Talking Heads. Everybody does. I, I'm going with Dune. I don't care what anyone Dune? says. Dune. I watched Dune. that like in the last two years. <laughs> it's Patrick Stewart has a puppy. <laughs> yep. And a pony so tail. weird. If you've it's ever read strange. the book and seen the movie, the differences between them are just like an endless chasm. It's like a shirtless fight with Sting in the end. I guess all the what? the drug aspects of the Dune film were added by Lynch. No, 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 no that movie like is well, I know, deals with drugs. I know the, I mean, the, the book spice. Deals with it. There's the spice, but like the the that everyone's obsessed with outside of that, like where they're like they're. They have their mantras to themselves about taking the drugs. No, that was in the book. Lynchian. No, that was in the book. Okay. Yeah, no, the the laser sound blasters that would predate laser tag. That was Lynch. Okay. (laughs) Okay. He invented laser tag. He apparently in that movie, it's very laser taggy. That's how he funds all his films. (laughs) But what did you say? The difference between them is an endless what? Chasm. Okay. I think you said chasm. Okay. JV mispronounces things. It's just JV's like, it's an a, aspect of his character that we embrace. funky style. Yeah. I didn't know if that was Dune lore and you were making <laughs> a crazy joke. In no. Dune, they call a wide <laughs> gap between <laughs> two I'm just going to start doing that in the office. In the it's book, like it's a Dune <laughs> reference. <laughs> Parentheses, this is pronounced. It has, the, it has the pronunciation. You have the arrested so nar- yeah. or developed narrator. But yeah, Eraserhead's f***ed up, man. Ah, cool. Uh, <laughs> I feel like the only logical answer is um, his cameo in Louis. Uh, as like the instructor that is really great, actually. coach him th- late night. It's so good. I feel like when he shows up in Twin Peaks, I don't think he's an actor. I think he would admit that. And I think his character in Twin Peaks was just a way for him to be in his show without acting because he can just shout every yep. line. Oh, God. <laughs> It's uh, pretty great, though. It is pretty great. <laughs> Jordan writes in and says, Hey, GI crew, I'm curious what y'all think will show up at the Final Fantasy 30th anniversary event on January 30th. It's also the 20th anniversary of Final Fantasy 7, so you'd certainly think they'll be showing something for the remake. And there have also been rumors of the older games coming to PS4. Not just that. That rumor, I don't know if you guys have seen this, is that it's for a bundle of like every Final Fantasy up through 12, I think. It's really? Barring 11. And like a $60 package? Yeah. All right. Anyways, uh, is there anything in particular you'd all like to see at the event? 
Also, stop picking on Brian Chase so much because he's clearly a nice guy that just really loves Sonic more than any other series. <laughs> that no. guy sucks. <laughs> I think we're going to see uh, Shay uh, in his new career at Square showing up at the Final <laughs> Fantasy event. No, we love Shay. So, uh, what do you guys want to see? Square is weird because they always announce stuff way too early. Like, way too early. Wasn't there... How long ago was uh, Versus 13 or 2007? Years, and that turned into 15? Right. And yeah. the 7 remake is still years I feel out. We don't know exactly when that 7 remake is coming out, but that True. could not be a case. Maybe of them jumping the gun. But Kingdom Hearts 3, it always makes me laugh yes. that they announced it so long ago. They're trying to stay current, stay hip for the Disney fans, and they announced the Big Hero 6 tie-in. And now that's going to be like ancient Disney. Might as well make a Dumbo tie-in trying to be relevant. Big Hero 6, come on. And did you see the the interview with Nomura? I think uh, uh, Famitsu Silicon had it. Era. Yeah, no, Silicon, Silicon Era translated oh, they translated Famitsu interview. That's and right. he's like, yeah, there's still worlds we haven't even touched yet. And oh, I was just no. like, oh, no. This w- is going to be so far off. It would be nice for that... To- for them to reveal just like a new world. Like that was the most recent thing was that they had Big Hero 6 mm-hmm. art. Like maybe now they will have um, Zootopia stuff. Or so something. we're really looking forward to that Kingdom Hearts announcement for the Final Fantasy 30th anniversary. <laughs> I feel like it's going to be yeah. a nice tie-in. I hope they don't announce 16 unless they're ready. I hope they focus on oh, they 7 know. Remake. Sure, yeah. I really yeah. hope they just focus on 7 Remake and yeah. make that front and center and don't try to confuse us with multiples at once. Mm-hmm. And don't. then I would love to see more games brought forward like the the classics brought that, to having the systems. full bundle be really cool, cool. that'd yeah. be amazing do you think maybe i mean probably 15 dlc trailer yeah or something i'm actually still like into 15 i'm still playing it like going for all the achievements so i i'm wow. ready to jump back in with new content they like, have enough i'm with you randall they have enough <laughs> announced yeah, to show that and still get fans excited don't go nuts. Don't yeah. do that thing. Too many they, pots on the stove already. Like Totally. Because I think they showed uh, 10, 11, 12 at once. Like, don't yeah. show 16, oh, 17, yeah. they 18 had art right for now. 12. Like, right up. That's what yeah. I remember that. Yep. Yeah, it was the city. Um, Scott Campbell writes in and says, Ben and friends. Yes, dear friends. Um, what's one time as a fan you felt like developers heard you? Uh, he then has a great example. He says, for me, it was when GameCube controllers were announced for another production run in the year 2014. I had already started practicing Super Smash Bros. Brawl with a classic controller because I knew there wasn't going to be a new way to carry GameCube controllers forward with the Wii U. Nintendo then exceeded my expectations, and I felt like they were reading my mind when they made that accessory for Smash 4. Uh, were there times where developers released a game, and it's like, my God, they heard us. I feel like we talked about one earlier in this show with Resident Evil 7, right? Mm-hmm finally at least giving it their all for pure horror yeah then the two remake announced yeah you know? i feel like doom yeah, like after example. doom 3 like people i don't think i wasn't disappointed by doom 3 because when you understand that game in the context of like half-life and stuff and what it was trying to do like narrative driven then it makes sense but there were a lot of people who were disappointed that oh this isn't doom in 3d 3d and then you know the new doom is i mean it's just doom with next gen graphics so yeah. I always think back to obviously Stardew Valley, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but Mega Man 9 is mm. such absurd fan service, just mind boggling. Uh, and then I think Breath of the Wild, I think it's going to be largely designed for those old school Zelda fans that just want more freedom and to go explore yeah. an open world. So, I yeah, like that could it. be. Uh, Dalen Briggs says, I have one pre ordered, I have a Switch pre ordered, and the Zelda game, but I haven't yet played Skyward Sword. Should I go back to it? I realize now it's a bit lengthy for the podcast email, so if you don't want to read the whole thing, I understand. Oh, it looks like I edited this a little bit. <laughs> um, but should he go back to Skyward Sword before Breath of the Wild? I don't think he needs That's to. That's implying that he's pretty complete on the series. Maybe, yeah. It's if a that's game. the case, I think you should. I feel like people crap too much in Skyward Sword. Yeah, I actually played it recent, like not a ton. I think I played it for like an hour or something, and I was like, this still feels really good. It's like, an eight out of 10 in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I, it's worth playing. I, I don't think like if there's other cooler games to play right now. It's not one like oh man, you need to play Skyward Sword. That's like one of the best Zelda's ever. But it is a it is a great Zelda game that you could you could probably skip. I also I wonder or I worry about him burning himself out on Zelda. Like in full disclosure, we're talking about having uh, Link to the Past as a game club game, mm-hmm. uh, and then it's like, well, do we want to do that and then dive immediately into Breath of the Wild? There's something about really savoring the big new Zelda release, you know, and not being burned out on the all, They're all kind of before. like all in games that take over. You know what I mean? Like you can't really step away from a Zelda game for a long time and return to it. Not if right. you're sane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they look like they're going to be pretty different though. Though, you know, that's yeah. the devil's yeah. advocate to that. If one's going to be a 
more open worldy, and the other yeah. one's kind of traditional. It is. Skyward Sword has a really slow beginning. Yeah. Holy hell! It does. It does. It is important to the wider Zelda timeline. It's like the first. Yeah. In the in the Zelda timeline, it's we were like just talking originates about the the Zelda story. That's true. Even I mean, it's not the most logical thing, but it not totally does. Yeah. Uh, Girahim, the villain, I think is awesome. He's always yep. licking the uh, screen and licking his sword. It's my favorite uh, version of Zelda. Like visually and yeah. also her character. And I think it's a genuinely sweet relationship yeah. between those two. I think mm-hmm. it's the strongest Zelda story. Yeah, definitely. We're in the really I think going so. for it. Yeah. yeah. So we're just going to leave you confused. Glad we cleared that up. <laughs> you don't need to play it. You don't need to play it. <laughs> you don't need to play it, but if you want to, go for it. It's good. Uh, let's see. Can I be self indulgent for a little bit? Is that a Absolutely lot? not. Go to no, the next question. Boy. Okay. Uh, so then, no. So Luke Doherty from Pennsylvania writes in. He says, Hey, beautiful people. Uh, everyone always asks gaming journalists what route they took to get in the industry, but I never recall Ben Hansen talking about his education and work history. I'm in college and I'm getting increasingly interested in being an overall video production guy. Uh, that's my title. So I'd like to ask Ben Hansen uh, a few questions. What made you want to do video? Um, I shot a lot of home movies and enjoyed it, and I really like Spielberg, and I have nice friends that we shot videos with. Uh, what was your major in college? Double major. Cultural studies and comparative literature and studies in cinema and media culture and a minor in art, technically. What class taught you the most least? Uh, the least is some film theory garbage, uh, and the most <laughs> is just like this raw video production class that was like all day Saturday, and you had to do a bunch of complicated stuff. Um, what jobs did you have for Game Informer, video production houses, and community TV? Uh, How did you hear about Game Informer? Uh, Phil Kohler tweeted out the job opening. Uh, what was your favorite least part? Least favorite part of the job? Um, favorite is when like get good feedback on a video. NeoGaf picks up a, a good thread from some of our cover story stuff. Uh, least favorite is troubleshooting tech. Uh, any tips for getting where you are now? Yeah, go to a community TV station. They have a ton of equipment and a ton of software that you can use, and they're desperate for attention. Please pay <laughs> attention to community TV. Like just go there and use their equipment. Best case scenario, just use it. It's right there. Um, are we ever going to see that wasted video of Kojima and Dan Riker together? No, you won't. Uh, so there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Luke. Um, Jordan from Egan, Minnesota says, Hello, Game Informer crew. What's a great book you read recently that you'd like to recommend to others? I know you're a video game magazine, but at least one of you must read books. <laughs> What's the book? Come on, brother. You're just talking about Dune, you hack. So- yeah. <laughs> uh, I read a great series recently, really, recently called Ancillary Justice. It's sci-fi. And it's super cool, and I don't want to talk about it too much because it would go. Just leave it at that. Yeah, just go read it. Just go read it. It's good. It's it good. It's a series, so. It's three books. Trilogy. Yep. Okay. The old trilogy. I just read the oral history of The Daily Show. Um, I want to read that. Quick read, very good. Gets into some fantastically nitty gritty details about just small feuds in the office, friendships that were torn apart over ultimately silly things. Really, really great, and like a really surprisingly raw and honest look at the pros and cons of that show and working with Jon Stewart. Mm. Kyle, do you read? Think, yeah, I read. Mostly, I haven't read a lot for myself lately. Um, I read stuff at my daughter. Here's a weird, a super weird recommendation. There was a movie recently called Home. It was like a DreamWorks animated film. Yeah, terrible title. It was, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a fun fine, movie. It's a fine animated movie. The book, like the what the, the inspiration for the movie is a book called um, The True Meaning of Smek Day. It's really funny. <laughs> Smek Day? Smek Day. It's actually like really Sounds funny like a political and activist. bizarre and strange. And it's kind of like an alien post-apocalyptic tale of like this young girl trying to make friends with like one of the aliens and trying to push out e- like far more evil aliens off the planet. It's actually like the book was pretty cool. I actually liked it. I, li- I like that you guys as dads were on the same wavelength when <laughs> Kyle said home. Brian was like, yeah, yeah it's a good movie. <laughs> yeah. There's, yeah. there's yeah, a sequence fine. where there's a ship that like flies through Saturn's rings. It's yeah. very visually it's like cool. the opening of Very Rogue beautiful. One. Uh, is that happening? Even better than that. Is that right? It's yeah. way better. It's as good as Rogue One. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, Bo writes in and says, hey, I crack up hysterically every time you and Ben Reeves do the wah, 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 <laughs> freak out on the show. Uh, it makes me think of repetitive button bar sound bites <laughs> radio shows do often. Uh, do you ever think you'll implement a, basically, what's that called? Help me out. A soundboard? Soundboard, yeah. thank you. Um, <laughs> Clearly, we're, it's on track to be included in the podcast very soon. <laughs> yeah, the classic soundboard button. Um, what's that thing called? We've got um, that Dan Reichert soundboard that we're always... Got we do. We did pocket. start <laughs> to genuinely create oh, one. In really? addition yeah. to like the joke one from the Resident Evil thing, uh, mm-hmm. he says, are you ever going to make one that Wade can spam at any moment uh, into the show? We've talked about this for the podcast and replay. It's a slippery slope. We've done more of it in replay yeah? as we've become less sane as we do this show <laughs> it's it's 
I think it's a fun idea. It's a little self-aggrandizing. I want to do it and pull from like old uh, sound tests on old video games. It'd be fun just to get some silly voice samples and stuff, but it just turns too wacky too yeah, quick. The thing we did recently was on the Sonic Super Replay, whenever Shay would say something positive about Sonic, we'd play a laugh track clip from Seinfeld with the bass <laughs> <laughs> and just super loud in his cones. Like it was... <laughs> It was amazing. Uh, I thought he loved it. He thought it was hilarious, I assume. How's that Super Replay of Sonic 2006 going? Ah, it's great. I see a lot of good comments on YouTube. Seems like people are digging it. People that like watching broken. us suffer. <laughs> it is so an awful game. Has it gotten to the point that I warned you about where it's stopped being fun, now it's just painfully um, bad? I mean, now we got there like in the first 20 minutes. I think, but <laughs> there, there are times, yeah, where we're just not even touching the controller and Sonic's just running forward down the road. And then, like, we'll die, and then all of a sudden, we'll do that same sequence, and he'll just be like, <laughs> veer off to the right and die. And we're like, I it guess is, that's the end of my playthrough. It's oh, wow. hilarious. Like, I actually am enjoying it, because it's 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 so fun to watch someone else play. But you should laugh. check it out. Check out episode one. That's that's what I'll say. Yeah. If you if you uh, want to see editors suffer playing a bad game. A lot one of, of the worst games of all time. A lot of good Ben Reeves workshop and characters. Oh, no. <laughs> it's really great. <laughs> There's a lot of good ones. Yeah, as Ben Mi starts Miyazaki to lose it, he turns appearance. into different people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cortland from New Ulm, Minnesota says, Hello, Ben and GI crew. I'm a huge fan of everything that Gameformer puts out. Thank you. Uh, but that ass kissing is relevant. They say, I was curious, though, if all the videos you guys post online will always be there. When I'm 60 years old, which is 30 years from now, will I still be able to watch replay episodes? Is there a reason or a chance it might all disappear someday? I guess there's a chance, yeah. Just be safe. Rip everything we ever do off of YouTube and keep it on giant external hard drives. Yeah. I mean, if Vine has taught me anything. Oh. Don't. Well, what did they do with Vine? Actually, it was very cool what they did is at it right about like a month before it was like a, a shutdown entirely, there was a, a single link where you could go to download every single one of your Vines and as one package. So what I did is I downloaded all of my Vines and I uploaded them as one long ass YouTube video. So you can go watch my daughter grow up over the course of me tracking her vines. I don't know. <laughs> no, you have I to do this. like quality answer. comedy television. Anyway, I thought it was a cool thing for them to do, to let you just get all your files at once. Yeah. That's that is, very nice. That is nice. Yeah. yeah, we'll certainly think about it if a meteor ever hits us, you know, or 30 years from now, yeah, if we I ever go under. Like, I don't... I don't think we're you're losing much, though. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Uh, well, it is. It's oof. such a scary thing. Like when One Up went down, there was such a mad scramble to like, is every One Up show archived? Is every podcast archived somewhere? And there are just like fan zips out there that have all that stuff. So I understand it's scary, but I, I promise if that day ever comes, we will do our best to make sure that they are preserved in some capacity. I think the YouTube account is linked to my email, so we should be good for a while. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, all right. On that morbid note, uh, I think that's it. <laughs> what stands out to you guys? End of day. I really like. <laughs> Uh, the Minnesota game developer moving to Minnesota question. <laughs> Just because, <laughs> like, it branched off and, like... I, I I actually kind of feel the same way. Like, what? I thought it was, like, a weird-ass question, but I kind of liked the discussion. That was like, yeah, that. like, it gave way to a good discussion. Good yeah. discussion? That was, like, a sentence of you saying the word machine games, and then we moved up. I just no, said can... machine games, machine games, machine games. Then we yeah, got a chance to make fun of JV yeah. and his love for machine games. But then we started talking about, like, Call of Duty and stuff from that question. No, I actually, no, started, no, that, that was, was another. That was from the college. Yeah, Duty I'm talking question. about my out of my ass. I like. I actually do like that college Duty question. That's yeah, I do too. Up. And I like the most in depth look at studios that we got as well. I like that one. I like in depth studios. Yeah, I can give it in depth to that studios. One. All right, Forrest Lastman. This is unanimous. Gavel, gavel, gavel. Congratulations. We'll ship you out something really nice. The best thing you've ever seen in your life. Uh, thanks, guys, for being on the show. That's it. Sure. Well, yeah. it's thanks not for it for the lovely us. listeners because coming up after this little musical interlude, we're talking to producer. Uh, Kara, game director Dan from Vicarious Visions talking all about the full remake of the first three Crash Bandicoot games in the insane trilogy. So stay tuned for that. Kara and Dan, welcome to the Informer Show, guys. Hey, Hi. thank you. Yeah, it's an honor to have you. You guys are in New York, right? Yes, that York, we are. New York yeah. State. Though. Yes. Not, you know. Upstate. Not, not the cool New York, the New York State. Naturally. I don't know about that. <laughs> Upstate's pretty cool, too. Right. It's, if, if we mean temperature, maybe. <laughs> so no, it's looking, pretty neat over here. Yeah. I was looking you guys up a little bit. It looks like, Dan, you've been there at Vicarious Visions for a thousand years. And Kara, are you relatively new? I'm at, yeah. We're like both ends of the spectrum. I'm way younger than I look, and Dan's way older than he is. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I have a busy face. Um, no, I've been there for 19 years at this point. Oh so, my God. Uh, yeah, I started here when uh, when you were two. When I was two, no. <laughs> um, Jeez, 1997, so 19 years, and yeah, there was like five people here when oh I started. Oh my God. We actually just interviewed uh, the founders of Vicarious Visions uh, a little while ago oh. on the Game Informer show, so I got the full rundown yes. of the studio. Yeah, well, I don't have to repeat it then. Yeah, so, but you have worked on Crash Games before, right? Yes, I have. Um, I want to say ooh, around 2002, 2003, I was the creative lead on uh, Crash Nitro Kart, which was... You know, the sequel to uh, Crash Team Racing for Vivendi, Uni Vivendi Universal. Um, and then the studios also made uh, a number of handheld uh, Crash Bandicoot versions as well. Yeah. And then uh, more recently, we've uh, done the Crash Adventure Pack for Skylanders Imaginators. So you guys... So kind of, yeah. A bit of a blast from the past, yeah. You are now the Crash Bandicoot-ish studio, right? You're the go-tos. So, yeah. <laughs> How does that feel? Feels great, you know. It's kind of like a, a a homecoming or a reunion for me with a crash. You know, I like crash a lot. It was yeah. fun. And I mean, as yeah. the new person to me, he's easy to fall in love with. Holy cow! Like I'm, I'm like attached now. He's it's a great franchise. The character's adorable. He's like got that right. He's a little bit like a punk. You know, he's you know a little bit of a badass. And so I, I think everybody, you're you're taken back to being you know kind of a a belligerent well I am a little bit of a belligerent teenager and you know <laughs> even back to the to a little bit to the 90s and so yeah he's it's, it's fantastic to be working on him and like I said you, you, you get attached to the it's a great game it's a great character I mean it's there's a lot to love there yeah you were a belligerent teenager I yes we'll get my mom on the line and she will <laughs> wholeheartedly agree which I definitely was you used to wear some bright blue pants all the time and spin around constantly I uh, yeah. Cool. Pretty <laughs> cool <less>. stuff. <laughs> so you just want to walk me through the process of this remake occurring. When did you first hear about it? What was the first vision? How does this whole thing come to be? I think, I mean, I love that, you know, Dan can walk through some of the more practical things, but I think I, like, I think it came from, it really did come from the fans. Uh, and I think, when I think Sony, Activision ourselves, obviously, they heard this love of this franchise and hey, these and such as these games and like bring them back, and especially as it became closer to the 20th anniversary. Um, there was more and more, uh, you know, more and more fans in the forums and videos and so on saying, hey, we love this, we love this, bring it back, please bring us back. So I, they were heard, and it's like let's do this. And again, because it was it's timely because of the 20th anniversary. So. I mean, that's really what inspired this. Yeah. yeah. So, so we kicked things off around the 20th anniversary with the Crash Action Pack. Uh, it's a mouthful. For uh, Skylanders Imaginators. And uh, uh, we got that done. And Sony and uh, Activision approached us and said, hey, do you want to do a remaster of the original games? And, you know, we didn't have to think long about it. We danced around the studio. Going, yeah. Yes, yes. It, it's it's pretty awesome, uh, awesome responsibility because I mean you think about it, these are games that have really kind of defined a lot of people's childhoods. You know, growing up, uh, you know, with their PlayStation ones being their like their first video game console. I mean, I personally a little old for that, uh, but you know, still, it was uh, really something where we we just thought about it a bit. We're like, wow, we have a chance to really kind of bring this to new audience and still you know, recapture those uh, glory days for a lot of the other folks. So why was it pitched to you as a remake or remaster? Was there ever making a new game on the table? Um, that is not something uh, that folks approach us about. Yeah. Uh, who knows? But right now it was approached as a, a remaster where they really wanted to take the three original games that a lot of folks fell in love with and bring them back. Yeah, it's it's strange timing. It seems like... Crash fans have been in a bit of a drought for a while, and now suddenly it's Crash and Skylanders for what you guys made, the remake, and then also just bizarre timing with that Uncharted 4 Easter egg uh, relatively early yep. on in that game. Why do you think there's so much Crash now? Is it just, did Sony and Activision figure out some rights issues, or why the deluge now? I think, like I said before, I think it, it's a largely, it's the 20th anniversary. I think that was a large amount. Of, that's a, a bit of inspiration. Um, I think of just a little bit of 
luck and things just falling together at the right times and you know teams being available uh and that's you know more or less how it happened nothing more nefarious than that i believe yeah yeah i think also too it's just one of these things where it almost seems in culture these things kind of come in cycles you know it, it's like almost like this peak nostalgia moment you know where everyone's clamoring to kind of you know uh, be able to play it again and not just a crash game but the originals so you know enough times pass where people are like yeah it'd be awesome to to go back and do this yeah so there's nice synergy i mean like dan mentioned with um crash being in the the skylanders uh, imaginators and he like he appears in one of the episodes one or two yep. episodes of the uh their tv show the academy that's really neat too because that starts to allow a new generation so obviously that that's for a younger audience those those games and that tv show but what that allows those guys to do is like start to grow up with knowing Crash and then being able to get a hold of these games and you know being introduced to them just like people were 20 years ago. So there's a really nice synergy there with yeah. you know getting those fans that were enjoying the, the games 20, 15 years ago, but then um, getting a new audience that could yeah. love yeah. them just the same. And some of those old fans might have kids now too that yeah. they can share it with. Exactly. Of course, yeah. yeah. So Dan, That's you fun. you learn about the project. It's pitched as the remake remaster. What's step one of remaking these games? How, how do you form the team? What do you guys, what's the vision? Right, so um, certainly our first step is figuring out what the team is. I mean, having the team is the most important thing. Because with the right team, I mean, if the vision is you know good, great. If the vision is wrong, then the right team can course correct, right? So. So really, uh, a lot of what we did was really look for, you know, the Crash fans in the studio. Uh, we've got a lot of Crash fans. And then, you know, taking a step beyond that, really looking at, you know, like artists and audio guys who really wanted to work in that cartoon style. And, you know, just really finding the people that were going to deliver on this. And it um, really wasn't hard. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a lot of them in the, uh, in the studio. And once we got that team together, it was really, the next step was really just immersing ourselves in Crash. Because, you know, for me personally, as an example, I mean, I hadn't really played them in a good 15 years at this point. So you really got to kind of acquaint yourself with the games again. And there's a lot to learn. Uh, they are just jam-packed full of all sorts of stuff. You yeah. Know, be it gameplay to easter eggs to whatever so or so when you're you know, playing it are you like are you hey, capturing the gameplay then or are you taking a bunch of notes what's it like when the game director of the remake plays that original trilogy um for me yeah i mean it's it's taking a lot of notes it's uh starting to really not just dig into what the games were but dig into what inspired the games in the first place try and put yourself in the minds of Naughty Dog and the folks who created the games in the first place and start looking at their inspirations because, you know, um, certainly when you're taking something that was of a PlayStation 1 generation, just copying it, you know, polygon for polygon isn't going to get the results. You've got to deliver on kind of what the feel of the game was, what the spirit of the game was, what people remember the game to be. And so to do that, you know, we started digging even past Crash into what inspired, you know, your, your Jason Rubens and your Andy Gavins. And so we started, you know, going back to uh, Animaniacs, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, the Who Framed Roger Rabbit, uh, Looney Tunes, things like that, to really kind of get a sense of the tone of what they were originally trying to capture and then start using that to kind of inform the decisions we're making as well. Does that just mean animation style or what are the details within that change? Um, I think a lot of it, uh, animation style certainly can inform uh, that type of thing, but I think a lot of it just comes down to tone um, and really... Tone and humor. Tone and humor and trying to capture the zaniness and the charm. Um, I think, you know, uh, modern animation certainly has changed a lot in those 20 years. You know, it's dominated a lot more by, uh, you know, CG heavy productions, you know, be it your... Pixar's, your DreamWorks, your Blue Sky on the high end in the movies. And the television shows, too, are copying that to some extent. So, so really, you know, uh, a lot of that animation that I was referencing just now harkens back to more of a, a classic style of animation. And it, it just has a, 
a slightly different sense of humor. And so we wanted to make sure the team really kind of understood that uh, because it is a bit different than some of the stuff we've done in the past. But sorry. No, no, sorry. that's great. I mean, you know, and really, pre-production for the whole Oops. team was was largely this, was just really doing getting a hold of any kind of uh, documentation. I mean, this, these games are also one of the... One of the neat things about these games is they are actually very uh, well documented. For the past 20 years, you can find interviews, you can find articles. There's a white paper on, you know, what the Japanese version had in it versus the, you know, there's like a lot, a lot of information. There's tons and tons of gameplay videos, and those have been really, really valuable sources of uh, information for us. Uh, there's a lot of little details, a lot of edge cases, a lot of if this, then that with the crates and uh, uh, collectibles and so on. And um, having that information out there has been really, really valuable. So the whole team in their discipline took the time to actually learn as much as they can. And yeah, we literally recreated design documents so that we could make these. Um, so yeah, that was that was pre-production for us, and yeah. you know, the team really knew they had, like you know, Des, we had to really get this right, and uh, all those details we had to we had to find them, we had to uncover uncover them, make sure they're right or better them. Um, and what a nice other nice thing about being able to have this uh, sort of this uh, retrospective look at the, you know, the original games is going okay, what do we see? the original development team learn across the three games yeah um, and where did they say oh we're going to improve like well that's something that you know you could see in the first game and by the second game they they improved it so it's like well we can now have the benefit of hindsight and say yep yeah, that was something they obviously yeah. improved so we're going to bring that across all three games do you have examples and- i know i know andy gavin has written about just how the controls in crash one are a little bit stiffer a little more rigid is that a good yeah. example, just uh, making things a little more fluid? Are there other examples of things that you've kind of spread out across all three now? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, controls are definitely key among that. Uh, another thing that was critical, uh, if you remember Crash 1, its uh, save game system was very thin. Yeah. Uh, you know, So we've gone in and basically said, all right, we're unifying the save game system for all three games. And we're even adding some modern options to it. So it's not only manual saving at a, a station, we've also added auto saving uh, for more modern players. And you know, your more hardcore players don't have to use the auto saves, uh, but they're there for folks who, who need them and just don't think uh, to save on a regular basis. Um, we've also gone back to the checkpointing system and really tried to make sure that you know, um, all the checkpoints are behaving in a consistent manner. Uh, I think one of the reasons uh, getting 100% in Crash 1 was a lot more difficult was because, you know, the checkpoints didn't save your uh, crate progress uh, through a level. So you basically had to, you know, complete a level without dying in order to get, you know, your 100%, your clear gem at the end of the level. So, you know, and they went and changed that for Crash 2. So we went back and unified that. Uh, But even beyond that, too, then you start thinking about, okay, well, You know, they were a little more generous with their checkpoints in some of the later games. So we go back to the earlier games and, you know, start looking at, okay, what's the best place to put some of these checkpoints? And so I think it is a lot of these really subtle touches to, you know, try and make sure that, you know, it's not something you're, you're, unless you're, you know, a really diehard fan, you're going to notice. But I think it's just going to help the overall feeling of cohesion and uh, also, you know, just make the, the earlier games easier to pick up and play. I am curious, just if you can get technical, I, I would love it. But just explaining, if you were just to make a 100% faithful remake with controls-wise, everything, just spot on exactly like Crash 1, let's just say, for example, mm-hmm. what would feel different? Like, does a, updating the visuals change the way the game feels on its own? What falls behind with the gameplay if you do that? Like, what are those tweaks you have to make to the way Crash moves? Right. Um So if it were just a strict visual upgrade, uh, it would feel a little bit different. Um, And that's because, you know, animation and VFX and sound effects all play a subtle part in how something feels. Um, That said, I mean, if you were to measure it, you know, frame by frame against, you know, the original game, it would come out, you know, strictly looking the same. Uh, but it would feel a little bit different just with a strict visual upgrade. 
Um, in terms of how it would play, I, I imagine it still would feel, as Andy was describing, a little bit stiffer. Um, but more importantly, I think, you know, um, it, without uh, a lot of these subtle tweaks we're talking about, the game would feel just a lot more difficult and potentially frustrating. And I think the last thing we'd want to do, either for our fans or any new fans, is have them pick up and play the first game and say, oh, wow, this is so hard, I shouldn't play the rest of it. Because right. then why, why did we make it in the first place? We want people to be able to play this game and you know get into it and start Love and Crash the way that other folks have. I would assume this is in the Skyliners engine. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay, right yep. on. Um, uh, it's a full physics-based engine. Yep. The... Uh, we are basically using the engine uh, that was last used for Skylanders Imaginators, so it has all the the visual upgrades and uh, technical upgrades that Skylanders has allowed us to add to that engine over the years. Does that and so um, one of the things that we really like about using this engine is that it's really mature. It allows us to build uh, and test really quickly, um, but it also you know. Uh, the last Skylanders I worked on, as an example, was uh, Superchargers, and we just built this great uh, cloud technology, and we're able just to drop that right into Crash, and now we've got these awesome-looking clouds in certain levels. So, I mean, it gives us a lot of advantages. Water tech, lighting tech, you know, fur. You know, there's been a lot of things that we've been, you know, able to use from the engine and the work, like Dan said, you know. Uh, stuff that's been worked on over the years so we, yeah uh, and it really allows a lot of creative freedom for the team just to be able to go yeah, yeah we've got that now you know let's move on does but that I mean think, does that oh, mean inherently that I, it's going to look a little bit like skylanders like how different did the art team try and push things were you trying to make it a little more abstract we definitely wanted to push it in a direction that was more crash like um we didn't want it to feel like skylanders skylanders is like this heroic fantasy of bringing toys to life. And while that's cartoonish, I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier, that's not the tone we're shooting for. We're shooting for something that's a, a little more zany, uh, has a different style of humor. Uh, but beyond that, in terms of art style, it's a little grittier too. And so we wanted to make sure that that grit and detail was passed along into what you see now. So yeah, the art team had to recalibrate the direction a little bit. And that took a little bit of time because a lot of them are, you know, Skylanders veterans on this engine. So, um, but that's just one of those things, you know, through pre-production we worked on and continually doing passes on crash and on the levels until it felt like we were in the, the right spot in terms yeah. of what the, the new art style should be. And frankly, it's actually something where we have been sensitive to because we're, we might be known as the Skylander studio or so on. And because people have come off from uh, Skylanders titles, it's like, we definitely want to make this not as, you know, something, we might definitely want to make this something different and something that feels like Crash. Um, another fun thing about uh, Crash versus Skylanders is this, uh, Skylanders is a uh, kid's title uh, with the you know, associated ESRB ratings and this isn't so much. So we have a little bit more freedom to have some fun in places we might not have been able to with Skylanders as well. So um, yeah, exactly like Dan said, we, we've we really worked hard to try not to, you know, to differentiate it and make it look yeah. like crafts. Well, just to really geek out, because I'd imagine you guys are Crash Bandicoot experts at this point. Is that fair to say? You know that trilogy pretty well? Yeah, a little bit. I, 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 I'd <laughs> like to think so. Okay, so when you or went you back, can ask a hard question, then just prove us like exactly wrong. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. In one level and does this, and I'll be like, <laughs> yeah, oh. don't worry, it's not, it's not trivia per se. But I'm just curious <laughs> when you went, when you went back to study it and play it before, you know, venturing into the remake here. Was there anything that you appreciated? Anything new that you saw in the series where you're like, ah, I never appreciated this detail, this aspect of the original oh, trilogy's oh, gameplay? Absolutely. Every day, yeah. almost. Like seriously, like, there's like so many details. It's really sweet. We're we're still discovering things now, honestly. <laughs> you know, it's um, and again, uh, as Kara was saying, it's great to have the internet as a resource where we're able to, you know, really pour over. I mean, the fans have spent 20 years dissecting this game, so there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, but still, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a good example at this point of something we've just discovered. Um, yeah. Well, the t Mike Berman, our tech designer, yeah. was just telling me about, uh, I think he's, he was explaining to me, he's worked on the crate stacking rules and system, uh, 
well, since he started the project, and I think he's on the fifth iteration now, and they're still discovering uh, cases where it doesn't quite work the way they expected, or, you know, it's like, and the, the logic all makes sense once you start reverse engineering it, or, but it's like, it's very, it's a very iterative, iterative process with the testers. So he'll make the change, the testers will find a, a level where that rule set doesn't apply, throw it back, and then it's like, oh, now we see what you know where it's where it's going. Well, how For much? Me, personally, though, sorry. Oh yeah, how much are you guys communicating with Naughty Dog? I mean, do you have the original code from Naughty Dog? No. Uh, we do not have the original code. Uh, I don't think they have the original. <laughs> uh, they may, but. <laughs> What was most important for us to get was actually the original level data. And so uh, what we did uh, was reached out to Sony, and Sony was able to get that for us uh, via, uh, from Naughty Dog to us. Um, we don't interact with Naughty Dog on a, a regular basis. Um, we've got a few Naughty Dog veterans on the, in, on the team in the studio, which is cool. So they have some knowledge that they're able to carry on. Did they work um, on the Crash Trilogy or later? What's later. that? Later. Later, later yeah. okay. Uh, but um, generally, uh, it's been mostly us kind of either learning from what the internet has uh, put out there or, um, you know, Naughty Dog had done a lot of uh, GDC talks and things like that about particular systems they were proud of, and I'm old enough to remember going to those GDC talks, and I actually had my old notes on a particular system for managing difficulty and I had to dig them up in a box in my basement somewhere, dust them off, and there was a whole bunch of notes about how to, you know, implement uh, a difficulty system. So that was pretty cool. So when you said level data from Sony, what does that mean? If it's not the code, what, what is that data actually? So it's just the original uh, level polygons, basically. And so uh, what we do is we bring that into our engine and then we start using that one to build out the art. So the art is all built to be exactly the same size uh, as the original art. But then that serves as kind of a, a guideline for the rest of the game. Um, when you're making a game original, or not originally, um, when you're making an original title, you often start building out the handling first and you say, okay, well, the jump is going to go about this far, and this feels right and cool. Um, and then you start building the levels to those metrics that you've built based on your kind of early handling testing. We're kind of doing things in a, a, an opposite direction, where we have the original level data, and it's really important for us to have that so the game we know will feel right. But then we've got to build the handling toward that so that... Um, you know, when we've got a, a jump distance, for example, um, when we're tuning jump, we're like, well, we know that it's jump's got to work with this particular jump distance and this particular crate puzzle. And so we have a lot of guidelines that we can then build toward. Uh, if we didn't have that, I think it would be a lot more challenging uh, to be able to build something that feels right. Um, it would just always feel a little bit off and people would be like, I don't know, it's close, but it's not the same. We really wanted to get past that hump and get it as close as possible to what the original felt like. I use the analogy of um, uh, like getting a blueprints to a, a house or something like you're getting the, the that's and that's kind of what we got. So you know yep. you know the placement, you know the scale. But from there, it's like anything goes. You can yeah. you know whatever materials you want, you can uh, embellish where you want. But the it, it does give us the blueprints for how to build these, these I'd, levels. I'd imagine, you know. When you learn that you're making this remake, this remaster, however you want to phrase it, uh, it's like, okay, this seems doable, this seems doable. And then you look at Crash 3 and realize, <laughs> my God, this game is nothing but variety. Every level is yep. just bizarre new mechanics. You're flying, you're on the Great Wall of China, you're you know, sideways swimming. Is that as much of a hassle to deal with as I'd imagine it would be? Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's, it's, <laughs> I wouldn't call it a hassle. It is, it is challenging, certainly. Um, thankfully, we have some experience in that. Um, if you look back to Skylander Superchargers, we kind of did the same thing. With ah, Skylander. So, interesting. Um, so we actually have some good starting points for some of those vehicle modes, as an example. Um, but I think also, looking back to the original three games, each game's built on the next one. So... 
when you looked at Crash 1, uh, they actually had a writing mode on the Hog, yeah. which is very similar to Pura and Crash 3. Um, but Pura evolved from Polar, who evolved from the Hog. So, I mean, you know, we were able to basically look at the Hog, build out the Hog, evolve it to Polar, then evolve it to Pura. And so we're kind of following in the same footsteps that Naughty Dog did. And we're able to, you know, take the lessons we learned from the first one to the second one to the third one. Um, likewise, in, you know, Crash 2, they had a, a hoverboard, they had a jetpack. They were actually starting to push the variety in Crash 2 already. So, uh, again, that kind of sets the stage for Crash 3. So it isn't so much like a, a, a huge shock to the system. And also kind of knowing up front that we had to build all that in advance instead of kind of as they did where it's like, all right, well, I guess we're adding motorcycles and biplanes and jet skis now. We kind of knew up front that we needed to do that. And we were able to, you know, look back at the, the old stuff in our engine and say, okay, what can we use from our engine that, you know, make our lives easier when it comes time to implement the biplane and the jet yeah. ski. You mentioned jetpack. I just uh, replayed Crash 2 last year, and mm -hmm. big takeaway was like, my God, these jetpack controls suck. <laughs> it's so much worse than I remember. <laughs> are you guys changing the way the jetpack controls? Uh, we are certainly making sure that it doesn't feel so different that people are like, what's it's going on? Because right. isn't oh, it like but... triangle to go up, X to go down, something bizarre like that? Um, yes, okay. uh, but we're also offering basically, you know, additional use of the shoulder buttons now to be able to, to maneuver um, and also making sure players have the option to easily, you know, change the uh, uh, invert the Y axis, things like that. Um, so yeah, uh, overall, uh, we basically look at the controls of any of these, you know, alternate modes and say, okay, you know, obviously we want to pay homage to, you know, what they were originally, but, you know, for modern players, do they have different expectations for how vehicle controls should play? Yeah. And so, you know, we'll make some uh, adjustments here and there for those alternate modes. Uh, but when it comes to crash, you know, we wanted to make sure it was as one-to-one -one as possible because you really can't mess with those controls. Those are... Those are really, really, really good. Yeah. <laughs> so, what about, uh, do you guys have a favorite of the trilogy? What do you think is the strongest Crash game? Um, well, you can go first. Uh, I think it kind of changes from moment to moment. I mean, nope, I, sorry, Kara, you, know, you got to choose. Also, I mean, as we're in develop, development, you know, you, you're, you're playing the heck out of one, then you're playing the heck out of the other one. And by the way, we're all using the, just to sort of dial back for a second, we're all using the shorthand. Crash 1 is obviously Crash Bandicoot, 2 is Cortex Strikes Back, 3 is Warped. We all, I noticed all three of us were sort of resorted to our, and that's what we got. The shorthand we use internally here is one, two, and three. Anyways, um, I two is fun. I'm having a lot of fun playing two. Yeah. What's your favorite? Uh, my favorite's three. Uh, that was the one that I really started getting into it. Uh, I didn't actually play the first one. The second one I played a little bit. The third one I played a lot and then went back. Um, I'm really having a lot of fun with two as well. And, uh, but, you know, to this point, I guess, just given, you know, how we've been developing, um, I played a one so much at this point. So, I mean, it's, it's really hard to say, but three, you know, looking back was my favorite. So, I don't know. I how... think they, they just nailed their formula and it just, it felt pretty. What's your favorite? I ah, gosh, you know, one uh, was always my favorite growing up, but. As an adult, as a sophisticated gamer, you have to you have to give it to two. And actually, I had Jason Rubin on the podcast uh, last year, I think maybe maybe 2015, and he was saying that he thinks two is is the peak crash. Uh, not to you know put down Nitro Card or anything, but that's what yeah, sure. Rubin saw it is two is kind of the, the peak of their abilities. Uh, I'm curious. I don't know how far you guys are in development exactly, and if you've started to work on every level so far, but has there been one specific level that stood out as being especially challenging to modernize? Hmm. That's a great question. We are still in development, so there there still might be some that we discover I you know that uh, are even more challenging than ones we've had so far. Um, I think it's just uh, there's been some that have uh, you know raised questions philosophically like you know Dan talked about this whole difficulty question so there was some that when when we started 
playing it back and you know people outside the team started playing it it's like wow this is a really difficult level and that raises that you know some of those philosophical questions like what do you do about that and so those are challenging to modernize in terms of the philosophical questions those that raises yeah yeah, yeah crash is known for its philosophical think, questions yeah i think technically you know our technology is there and we're able to modernize any of them technically it just comes down to you know when it comes down to these really difficult decisions about, okay, you know, we've got something that plays as it did, you know, are there any ways we want to enhance it to make it uh, easier to pick up and play for new players? And that's tricky. That's not something we've entirely answered yet. So, you know, like we said, we're still in development trying to figure that out right now. Would you? In each of the level designers might answer yeah. that question differently yeah. as well. I, I know I remember I was talking to one of them uh, a little bit ago and uh, she was mentioning one of the boulder levels and just getting the speed of that boulder, it was it was like, you know, a bit confounding her. She's like, it's not math, it's not math. And then it was just like, it, it was clear that there had been some uh, hand, you know, hand tweaking that went into it. And so again, you know, we're doing a lot of this reverse engineering. So to get that to feel right and to get the, the, you know the states and you know everything like I said feeling correctly sometimes it's kind of looking back at how it played in the originals and then looking at ours and then just playing ours for what it is um, so I mean we've you know we've solved these problems as we've as uh, or these challenges as they've come up but there's probably been moments where you know it's been a little bit confounding it's like how do they do this how do they do this and yeah and, and that's fun and that's the challenge for these guys it's, it's not just a mere recreating what they what they're seeing it's like trying to understand how these things were made. I'd imagine it gives you a whole new level of appreciation for, you know, Andy Gavin, Jason Rubin and the coders in the early days of Naughty Dog, yeah. just for, like you say, it's saying it's not math. Like there's so many things that are hand tailored in a really complex way. Yep. Yeah. And the, and the amount of details, there's, there's obviously a lot of love and passion that went into that project. And, and we're very much inspired by that. And that's, I think, you know, Dan talked about this sort of the, the team we chose and brought together basically through a bunch of overachievers and you know, very you know, uh, experienced, passionate people. And that, that would bring that same care to their craft. You know, all the different ways you can die, for instance, that's one of yeah. my favorite aspects mm. of the game. Yeah. It's like, you know, that's, that's not cheap, you know, from a production point of view, having, what's it? A hundred and it's around a hundred, you yeah. know, uh, that many different ways. And it's all the VFX and sounds and animations. And you, then you have to re-rig something. And those, some of those are, you know, costly little moments and yet there's like yes we're doing every single one of those if not a couple more you know? oh you're and adding some more is that right maybe, what you're maybe, gonna add some more maybe okay maybe. we'll see oh we'll man see. that's like um, adding a new chapter to the bible that's that's dangerous territory guys yeah, exactly but like <laughs> that you know like i said like that level of um that level of care and detail is something that's very inspiring and like i said it's i it seems obvious that there was a lot of passion uh, and a lot of they were having a lot of fun, probably. I imagine when they're making this those games, so we want to bring the same. As well. Yeah, it's very important to us that the team is having fun while they're making this because this is the type of game where that sense of fun will show right through. Yeah. In the, in the final product. And, and, we, and we are allowing them the creative freedom to embellish and enhance and add wherever they see fit. You know, every every single moment when they're, when they're remaking one of those animations. So it's like, wouldn't it be funny if we yeah. add a little bit of this? And you've seen it, at, you know, in the work we showed at the um, at PSX, and fans totally picked up yeah. on this. It's like the uh, the result, when you finish a level yep. and you see the result screen, yeah. um, we've added a couple of little animations depending on how many crates is hitting, crashes head. And, yep. and so those are the little things like, hey, if you guys wanna, if you have you know time and the ability to do that, go do it, and if it, as long as it, doesn't yeah. you know markedly change the game everyone knows what crash is now add that stuff and have fun with it and yeah. um, so you know we do believe the team's having fun too. yeah and that's why it was really important to make sure that the team understood again the tone and the humor that we were going for i mean not only uh for the crash one level results did we add additional animations uh the designer who was coding it was like well what if we just you know uh let you drop the crates faster and so you can just hold down the button and it becomes a steady stream and you flatten them faster. And it's, it's, it's the same joke, but it's really punched up. And, yeah. you know, one of my favorite moments, you know, was just quietly observing uh, uh, folks at PSX playing 
and seeing those things that we put in for a laugh getting a laugh. You know? Oh, nice. So we did the job right, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'd imagine there's situations where you're looking at like enemy design specifically. I'm thinking of like especially the more mechanical levels towards the end of Crash 1 and Crash 2 where the mm-hmm. enemy designs are just bizarre. Are there those moments where it's like, I don't know what the hell Naughty Dog thought this was and when we have to make an HD version of it, how do we try and replicate whatever the f*** this is? Yeah, it, it's a challenge. Um, certainly at that point, I mean, we've kind of got to evaluate it on a, a couple of factors. Uh, one of them is that, you know, it still needs to serve a gameplay function. And so we want to make sure uh, as best as we can that it's communicating what its gameplay function should be. And I think in Crash 1, some of them didn't communicate as well. So that's an area where you know we need to continue working and revising the enemies. But then also it comes back to the team fun and making sure that, okay, we're not entirely certain what that is, but we know generally what it looks like. Let's let the artist kind of envision what a modern version of that would look like and still have a little bit of humor to it. So, okay. You know, um, so there's a little bit of interpretation there, but as long as we've got you know our inspirations right, it kind of guides us to the right point. Are you guys making any content changes? Uh, there's some things that just feel like such a relic from the 90s, and obviously that's part of the charm with doing a, a remake like this. But I think even of like Crash's girlfriend in the first Crash is like, woof. It's a it's an odd character. Are you is that character still intact? Tana is still there. Okay. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, Tana looks a, a little bit different. Oh. She uh, wears a different outfit now. She actually has an outfit that kind of reflects Crash a little bit more. So she's got you know her shoes and uh, shorts, and she wears a Crash T-shirt. Um, but also you know outside of just how she looked, I mean we didn't want to fundamentally change the character. Um, we try to, you know, enhance her personality a bit more. I mean, she is as equally strong as Crash. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the intro cinematic for the remaster, but, you know, she, she doesn't go down easily. She actually takes out a, a couple of scientists before they uh, restrain her. So, you know, we wanted to make her a little more feisty, you know. Uh, Give her a bit more, more agency. Yeah. Um, Tana was actually something we, you know, we spent some time talking about be- before we started. It was like... I mean, like all characters, you know, it's like, okay, what, what are we going to do about this? What's the, how do we modernize this? Um, again, it's a, it comes back to that same fundamental question. Uh, what, how do we stay true to the original, how, but, and yet how do we modernize it? So, it, and that, every single aspect of this game kind of gets that same, does have that same question. So with her, and we wanted to do, you know, take the time to give her due diligence, because she was controversial, and, um, so yeah, we talked about it and said, well, you know, just by virtue of making a 3D version of her that smooths out some of the curves, makes her a little bit more realistic. Um, she has runners, like there are sneakers, and um, but it was more or less just giving her agency. And you know, a lot of that might have been just because of restrictions and uh, technical restrictions they had back in the day. So um, now she can have more animations because you know our engine and the you know obviously the hardware can support it. So we can, you, like Dan said, we can flesh out her character, and that, yeah. that's not not just for her. For all characters, get a lot yeah. more facial uh, animation, and th- so the cinematics team is having is having a great time, really understanding what the characters' personalities are, and then, uh, like I said, fleshing those out with more moments, and again, especially with the face, uh, with their faces, giving them more personality and bringing those those out. And we've also given her some. She literally didn't have any uh, voice, yeah. So she just she gets to have some sound. So again, that's just all just giving her some agency and sure. making her uh, as much of a character as anybody else in the game. I am curious, uh, how are you guys handling the story stuff? Are you adding more cutscenes? And also, on that same front, uh, are you do you have the voice actors back? Are you just casting people that sound like Coco, or what's the overall storytelling strategy here? So um, I'll speak to the overall strategy, and you can talk about the voice actors, I guess. Um, So overall, the story isn't going to change. You know, we certainly aren't going to change something that the fans love so much. Um, So a lot of it is about uh, not so much the individual narrative beats, but uh, making sure that the characters uh, have their personalities coming across more 
and then you know uh, giving the characters you know a few more moments to shine I guess in the story um, also looking at ways just to add you know little gags here and there little Easter eggs into the the cutscenes and things like that um, we're also taking a look at um, especially in the earlier games uh, intros and outros for bosses and yeah. things like that to to help their personality stand out a little more too. Yeah, those are fun. Uh, I think that um, due to technical constraints at the time, you know, especially in Crash One, you know, the intros and outros uh, didn't have much heft to them. So we wanted to make sure that you know each boss got his or her due. I'm looking forward um, to seeing your intro to Pinstripe. Like, I don't think the character yeah. came up ever again in the Crash trilogy. This weird rodent with a machine gun mobster all of a sudden how the hell yeah. do you like how do you introduce that character in a way that makes any sense whatsoever well you just have fun with it yeah oh, okay <laughs> yeah you'll actually um he is subtly introduced in the opening cutscene, um and we made sure to kind of pay homage to this as well he's actually in one of the cages right before crash is transformed ah. so so they they Naughty Dog was like, yeah, we got that covered. It's just really hard to pick <laughs> up on. So, uh -huh. you know, we're just trying to make sure that that stuff comes to the forefront. And Papu Papu was also in one of those cages subtly? Uh, yeah, Papu Papu was not. Although, <laughs> okay. you know, I wonder that would be pretty funny. Um, no. <laughs> so not necessarily adding new cutscenes, just expanding on what's there? Is that the basic expanding idea? Expanding on what's there and making sure that the original intent and personality really comes through. Yeah. And then what about uh, voice acting? So yeah, I mean, uh, Activision reached out to um, a lot of, the, uh, I, I believe without fail, I'm making some double thinking, I, uh, every single actor was has been part of the Crash Bandicoot franchise in one game or another. So they all have, uh, you know, experience in the franchise. So we reached out to all the people we could get a hold of that had had some experience and. Um, I, and again, it's like I, I'm sounding a little bit like a broken record, but it was the same sort of creative direction that we gave them and the voice acting as the whole team has. It's like, yeah, let's let's make it feel like the original character. So let's look back again at how the original uh, character sounded and played and what their personality was. But hey, now's the chance to do it again. You know, and if you want to add a bit more, uh, you know, emphasis here or take it away there like, you know let's this is our chance to do that and have fun with it again so again we let them um uh, let them have fun in the studio uh, again with um, the less limitations with technically we have we also have a lot more sounds and emotes so uh whereas in the original games you might only hear one uh oof or one death sound or one hit sound now there's like a whole range of them um, so it just, that's just going to flesh it out and make it feel again more modern, make it feel more fun, more immersive. So, uh, yeah, that's where we went with the voice actor. Yeah. Did you get the Cortex actor back? Cause that voice is so good. Uh, we, uh, we got Lex Lang to do Cortex. So, no, we weren't able to get Clancy back, but I believe, uh, Clancy approved him. I'm Gave it a sure. thumbs up. I'm not sure. Okay. Don't quote me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right on. Uh, what about music? Is it, uh, an orchestral version of those original tracks, or what's the strategy there? The uh, same thing. I, uh, we've let the, so it's all being composed in house, and what the, and their approach. And I've got, you know, talked to them about it. Uh, they listen to each of the original tracks, and um, and like they said, it's just sometimes it's just a matter of having contemporary sounds, uh, more like in contemporary technology that's going to make it sound modern. But it's also uh, having modern sensibilities about what a contemporary game should sound like. So some tracks will sound a, a little bit more faithful to the originals. Some places will be like, hey, you know, I can make this a little bit more jazzier, I can add a little bit more bass, I can make it a little more funkier. Uh, so they can just, they can push it just a little bit here or there where it feels right and it suits the gameplay, it suits the level, the feeling of it. And uh, again, we're la allowing, some, you know, a degree of creative freedom there as well. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Do you guys have any nebulous plans for DLC or anything or any big changes that might be on the horizon? Uh, we that's those are questions we're always being asked about, even internally. It's like, oh, can yeah. we do this? Can we do this? Do we have time to do yeah. this? <laughs> um, TBD, TBD. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, I right will... now, the first thing is just to get these games uh, done, make some great, you know, like Dan said, we got to get nail that handling, get all the levels feeling right, you know, all these details and moments, we've got to get those in, get those, make those fantastic, yeah. really do the original games justice. Yeah. Uh, make sure, you know, the fans are going to really, really love this. Yeah. So just getting that, that's our first priority, is making sure these uh, remasters are amazing. So, so what I can say, uh, especially for all the fans who might be listening, is that we've heard them. Uh, we've been on the NeoGAF boards. We've been on Reddit. We've, you know, watched all the YouTube videos uh, that are either generally broadcast or addressed directly to us. And, um, you know, we know what they're looking for. And we've got a ton of fans uh, on the team as well, like uh, Kara was saying, that have all these ideas too. So... You know, we're really kind of sifting through all the ideas and uh, things like that that people want to see uh, that weren't in the original games and trying to make sure uh, that, you know, if we have the time for it, that we can deliver it. Okay. Uh, but since we're in development right now, we just can't really say one way or the other. Uh, we've got to really kind of, like Kara was saying, get get the core game done first, and then we can look at, you know, other big reveals after. Is there anything you're 100% ruling out, like the idea of Crash Team Racing being DLC? Is that just right out? I mean, we uh, there's like so many other stakeholders and people and companies involved in these projects. I wouldn't ever rule anything. I would say definitely we're never going to see that. And then um, somebody at a head office or somebody would say, let's do this idea. And then we're doing it. So I would never. I've, I'm I'm new to this industry, but I'm never going to rule anything uh, out ever again. Yeah, that's yeah. a smart way to think about it. <laughs> Okay, right on. Well, uh, the Crash Games is one of my favorite of all time. I'm really looking forward to seeing your game. It was just surreal at PSX seeing that trailer and seeing Papu Papu take center stage in a game trailer in the year 2016. Like, what the hell is this world coming to? It's amazing. Yeah, it was so great. I mean, PSX was such a boost for us as well. We knew, we felt like we were on the right track. We, you know, like I said, we are all overachievers. We've been pouring our heart and souls into this. And, uh, but then just seeing the love come back, it was just like, oh, yes, we, it was a little bit of a reaffirmation that we're on the right yep. track and Absolutely. just felt really good. Cause it is, a, it is like, I keep, I've said this before. It's a love letter to fans. It's a love letter to the franchise. So, you know, getting that, getting a love letter back in the form of like videos where people are screaming and crying, it was just like, oh, that means a lot to us. Nice. Are you guys treating it all like a, like a museum relic? Is there going to be like an archive or anything in there where people can look through original concept art? Do you see this as, I know, calling it a museum piece might be a bit much, but, you know, in the vein of what they did with like the Mega Man collection recently where they have a lot of archival right. stuff in there? Uh, that's something we've talked about, but again, we can't we can't commit to anything quite Okay. Yet. Well, that's just so fine. Figure things out. Even if it's not in there, I'm still really looking forward to this trilogy and playing through those games again and look forward to seeing what you guys put Fantastic. together over there. And thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode of the Game Former Show. Be sure to stay tuned and tune in next Thursday, actually, for the next new episode of the podcast. See you guys. Bye.